Welcome to the most complete VR development tutorial on YouTube, where we are going to make and publish together a VR game from scratch. At the end of this tutorial, this is what we will build together, a narrative-driven VR escape game which takes place in a spaceship. Basically, you are stuck in space because there is no more fuel, but one day you found a meteor which might contain something to save your crew. If you want to try the final game before starting this long video, you can do so on the itch.io page that you will find in the description. This project used Unity with their own toolkit to make VR game, the Unity XR Interaction Toolkit. It works with all VR headsets and the goal of this tutorial is to teach you in a fun way all the basis of making a VR game like VR setup with custom hand animation, grabbing, throwing objects, button, wheel, lever, continuous movement, teleportation, climbing and even more advanced subjects like optimizing and publishing the game. You can of course support my work on Patreon and get access to not only the source code of my project but exclusive content the link is in the description. Now, this tutorial brings together all the episodes of my Let's Make a VR Game series in one single video, which I hope will be a better way to follow along or jump to a particular part. I will also add timestamp in the timeline for the different part of the video. I'm Valem and this is Valem Tutorials, a YouTube channel dedicated to VR development. So feel free to like and subscribe to not miss the next video. But let's not wait any more time because we have a VR game to build. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let's get started with our game. So of course, we need a version of Unity to make it. And the version that I'm going to use is 2022.3.7 F1 LTS. LTS means long term support. So choosing this type of version will make sure that it keeps on running correctly in the future update. So anyway, now you also want to make sure that you have both Android and Windows showing here. And if you don't, you can click here then add module, select the Android build support with OpenGDK and Android SDK and click on install. Now, anyway, once everything is downloaded, you can go back to project, new project. And now let's give a name to our Unity project. I'm going to name mine Space Scrapper. That will be actually the name of our game. Then you can choose here a certain template. In my case, I'm going to select the 3D URP. Now, a little note here, there is also the VR core, which you can choose if you want to already have a VR setup made for your project. But in my case, I want to do this from scratch to show you every step on the way. So let's select this one and click on create project. And you might need to click here on install if you haven't done it before. But anyway, now the only thing to do is to wait a little bit. Okay, so here you go now, Unity is now set up, but now it's time to do this for VR. But before, let me just click here on Remove Readme Asset, as I don't want to see this again, then on Proceed. Perfect. And now to enable VR, let's go to Edit, Project Settings, and down below, click on XR Plugin Management, and then on Install XR Plugin Management. Perfect. Now for the plugin providers, what we want is Open XR. We can then click on yes. Okay, here you go. So as you can see, the OpenXR is selected for our plugin providers, but it is only selected for Windows. So we need to make sure to do this as well for Android. And for this, let's select here this tab and click on OpenXR as well. Now, as you can see, there is a little uh, warning icon next to OpenXR asking us to do a little bit more settings. And to fix this, we need to go to OpenXR and as you can see, we should be able to see here the interaction profile list. And this is where we can set the headset that will be able to play our game. So for Windows, what we can do is basically select all of them. So Valve Index, HTC Vive, Reverb, Microsoft Motion. There you go. I'm just going not to select these two. And so let's do the same this time again for Android. But this time I want to support MetaQuest. So we need to enable here this little Boolean. Then click on the plus button and select the Oculus Touch Controller Profile and the MetaQuest Touch Controller Profile. There you go. Now, this way, you should have a complete list of interaction profile, which will be the headset that can play your game. But as you can see, there is still a little warning button here. And if we click on it, we are going here to the Project Validation, which is an awesome tool that Unity has made to help us do all of the settings for VR currently. And as you can see, in the case of Android, there are two little warnings that we can fix if we click on Fix All. Okay, now there is just only one warning. Let's just ignore it for now and close this Windows. 
So now the XR plugin management is set up, but we need to install the Unity XR Interaction Toolkit. And to do so, let's go to Windows, Package Manager, go to here and Unity Registry, and search for XR Interaction. And you should see this one. So XR Interaction Toolkit version 2.4.3. So let's click here on Install. There we go. Now it is installed. We can go to samples and here install the starter R set by clicking on import. And there we go. Now at this point, everything should be ready to use VR in this project. So let's close this window and let's get started. So the first thing that we can do is basically remove the main camera as we are going to add our own VR camera. We can also remove the global volume because we don't want any post processing for now. And what I'm going to do is simply create a plane by right clicking, going to 3D object, plane. We can reset the position of the plane by going here and click on reset. And now it is time to add the famous VR camera I was talking about. So we could build it from scratch, of course, but an easy way to do so is to right click, go to XR, and then go to XR Origin VR. And as you can see, this already adds an XR Origin with here the main camera, which is using, and two controllers for the left hand and the right hand. Now on these two controllers, there is also a Nixa Ray Interactor that I don't want, so I'm going to select them both by pressing on the control key. Then down below, I'm going to remove the sorting group, remove the XR Interactor line visual, remove the line renderer, and finally remove the XR Ray Interactor to only have the XR controller. Perfect, but that's not it. Because as you can see, all of the input action of the XR controller are empty, but we can fill them automatically by clicking here, then default left controller for the left one, do the same for the right controller by selecting this time, default right controller, and everything is now ready. This should be able now with all of these input action to listen to the input of the player to move and use the controller. Now there is one last thing to enable, and I just seen that the XR origin is a bit far, so let's maybe recenter it by setting its position to 0, 0, 0. There we go. Now it is on the plane. Perfect. So depending on the type of VR game that you are making, you might want to track the floor or not. In the case of Space Creeper, the game that we are making, we want to take the floor position into consideration. So in the tracking origin mode, let's set it from not specified to floor. Beautiful. And now here, if the XR origin seems to float in the air, just make sure that here the pivot is not set to center, but to pivot. And as you can see, now everything should be great. And you should be reassured that the XR origin is placed at the ground. So now let's see if VR is working by clicking on play. But first, make sure that you, of course, have a VR headset plug to your PC. Now, in my case, as you can see, I have a Quest 2, which is plugged to my PC using the Oculus link. So basically, this makes it enable for me to test VR game on my desktop. But of course, this tutorial works for any VR headset. Now, you just have to make sure that if you want to test VR directly inside Unity, you of course need to be able to test VR game on the PC. And I will leave more documentation in the description below about Oculus Link and how to set it up if you want to learn more about it. But anyway, now it's time. Let's here set this windows to maximize and click on play. And there you go. As you can see, VR is working, but that's not it. I can see also some little controllers that are following my hands in the real world. So that's pretty cool. Now, in our case, we don't want this controller to show but to have animated end presents. And this is what I'm going to show you right now. So the first thing we want is to, of course, remove the controller model. We can do so by selecting both the left and the right controller. And down below for the model prefab, click here and select none. There you go. This will reset the model prefab to nothing. But now for end presents, we need, of course, a hand model, which will be animated. If you followed my previous tutorial series on how to make a VR game, we actually made the script to animate the end based on the input of the player and use it on the Oculus end model that are provided by their plugin. And so to help the get started on this project, I've packaged everything that we will need throughout this whole series inside one Unity package that you will be able to download in the description. And this package contains the end presents that we need. So in my case, I have it uh, right here. 
And what I'm going to do is simply drag it in Unity. There you go. So here is everything that this package contains and that we will need through all this whole tutorial series. So let's click on import. Perfect. And now to have a look at the amazing end presents that we made in the how to make a VR game series, we can go to let's make a VR game, Oculus Hands, Prefabs, and here is the two ends. So we simply need to drag the left end model under the left controller and the right end model under the right controller. And as you can see, they both have the animate hand on input component, which will listen to the pinch and grip input action of the player to animate the end accordingly. So if I click on play, as you can see, the ends are looking nice and are correctly animated. But I think that's for this special project. We can do better. That's right. We will add another custom hand model for this game. And you will be able to find it in the package that we've downloaded by going to Let's Make a VR Game, Terminator Hand, and Prefab. And there they are. As you can see, these two ends are looking really good. So I'm going to drag the left Terminator under the left controller and the right Terminator under the right controller. There you go. Now, as you can see, they seem to be correctly placed. But what you can do is actually use the uh, standard left end model to better place any custom model that you have. So for example, for the left end, I could basically move them a bit closer if I wanted, but everything looks good right there. But of course, these two custom ends are missing something. That's right. First, the animate hand on input, but also an animator to animate them. Okay, so what we can do is simply paste here the animate hand on input component on the other hand. So for this, let's right click, go to copy component, select the other end, right click, pass component as new. And here, the only thing that we want to change is, of course, not send the hand animator to be the left end model of the other end, but of this one. So this animator. So let's drag it over there. Now we can do the same for the right end. So copy this component, paste it on the right terminator hands and drag the animator on the hand animator. Finally, for here, the controller to control the animation, what we can do is simply duplicate again the controller of the right hand. So let's highlight it here. I'm going to select it and press on Ctrl D and rename this Robot and Animator. There you go. Now, if we go to Windows, Animation, Animator, there we can have a look at the Robot Hand Animator. We have here the two parameters, so the grip and the trigger, and here the blend tree. So if we double click on the blend tree, we can see that these two parameters are basically making it possible to choose between four animation, which is the default end position, the pinch, and the fist. But as you can see, these four animation are using the whole end. So what we need is actually to replace them with animation on the new one. And fortunately for us, as you can see in the Terminator hand, we have a bunch of animation that we can use here. So for the default one, I'm going to use the open end. For the pinch, the pinch. For the grip, without the pinch here, we can use the finger gun. And if the player press on the grip and on the trigger button as well, we can simply set it to the fist animation over there. So in other words, let's go here, drag the open end on the first one. For the other, which is pinch, we want to set the pinch. Here for this one, which is representing the end fist without the pinch, what we can do is select here the finger gun. And finally, for the last one, we want it to be the fist. And there you go. Everything is looking nice. As you can see, if I move here these parameters, it correctly animates. So if the player is gripping without pinching, it will do the finger gun. If the player is only pinching, it will do this pinch animation. And finally, if the player is pinching and gripping at the same time, as you can see, his hands close completely. And there we go. Now let's select our right Terminator hand. Let's go back to where we had our robot hand animator and drag it over there. And now what's cool is that in this case, because the right Terminator and the left Terminator ends are coming from the same 3D model, they are behaving with the same animation. So we can drag the robot and animator on the left end as well. So now everything should be ready. Let's go back to our scene. We can now select both the two 
previous hand model, remove them, and now let's click on play to see how these two new hands are looking. And there you go, as you can see, everything is looking nice. When I grip on both my controller, it does here this uh, finger gun movement. And when I pinch at the same time, my whole hand closed. And as you can see, in a matter of a few parameters, we were able to easily transfer all of the animation properties from one hand model to another. Now on the side node here, if you don't have any animation on the end, what you can do is actually build the animation from scratch using the animation settings on Unity. So to do so, basically, you would have to here open the animation windows with add tap animation. And here you could click and create a new clip and then set the correct position you want to assign for the animation on your right hand and use that on the blend tree. Now, a last fix that I want to show you is that I feel like the idle of the end is a bit too open in my case. So I found out that what we can do is go to the robot and animator, go into our blend tree. And now, as you can see, for the armature open hand, instead of setting its position to 0, 0, maybe setting it to minus 0, 2 will help because if the default value goes at 0, 0, it will kind of already add a certain distance from the open end and kind of, as you can see, already put the end into a better position, which is not too open and which I feel looks a bit better. So let's find out by clicking on play. There you go, guys. Congratulations. We managed to create a VR setup for our game to work with all VR headsets. But the coolest thing for me is this awesome custom end, which will look awesome on the game. Let's make a VR game together. And in this second episode, we are going to build the environment for our VR game. Okay, so for our 3D environment, we of course need some 3D model. Luckily for me, I found this awesome sci-fi modular pack, which is free on the asset store. So a big shout out to Carboos X for making this available for everyone for free. This is really amazing. And so to import it in our project, let's click on add to my assets. And there you go. Now we can click on open in Unity. After downloading it, we can click then on import to import it in our project. Then on import again. There you go. Now the package is installed, as you can see over there. And we can have a look at all of what it contains here in the prefab folder. So for example, let's click on corridor. And as you can see, everything is pink. But of course, this is because we are using URP, so the Universal Rendering Pipeline, and this package was made for the standard pipeline. So to fix this, let's select our sci-fi style modular pack, then go here to search type and set it to material. Now, instead of in asset, we want it to be the sci-fi style modular pack. And here is all of the material that are used in this project. So we can simply select them all and go into edit, rendering materials, convert selected materials to URP, proceed. And as you can see, all of the materials are turned into their good URP form, except for two, but we will not use them, so don't worry. Now, anyway, let's start building our VR world with all of the assets. Now, the first thing that I want is to go to corridor. We can remove here the research. And here we have a bunch of corridor that we can use. The one that I want for this project is this one, the corridor L. So we can simply drag it here in the hierarchy. There you go. Now I noticed something quite a bit odd in the materials again. As you can see, there are some weird dots. So we can actually fix this here by selecting one of the material, going to the base color material. And for the normal map, I'm going to set it to simply zero, which is basically the same as not using this one. Now, anyway, let's keep on going. So next, I want to add some wool. So here we can go to walls. And we have this world big here that we can drag as well in the hierarchy. There you go. Now we can move this world directly with these arrow. But what we can do is also press on the control key to snap them to a certain value. So there you go. We can also rotate by pressing on E, pressing on control key and dragging it to do a snap rotation. There you go. Now it is rotate 19 degrees and I can put it close to the other and make sure that everything seems connected. And as you can see, everything seems good. 
Now I want to fill these two corners on the wall and we can do so with another asset that we can insert in Windows. And here select the window big corner far. So we can simply drag it here directly in the scene windows. We can rotate it 90 degrees and move it to the appropriate position. So this one seems good. Now I'm going to duplicate this game object by pressing on Ctrl D, rotate it a little bit and do the same on the right side. There you go, everything is looking great. Now on this side, I don't want any wall, but I want a big door that the player will be able to open. So for this, let's go to doors. Here I have three types of doors. I think this door too is looking great. So let's drag it again. And as always, while maintaining the control key, let's move it to the good position. Perfect, now I want to block this view. So to do so, I have here this window big blocker game object. So let's drag it again in our scene, rotate it and place it correctly. Beautiful, this is really an amazing asset. Now let's duplicate this game object, rotate it 180 degrees and put it on the side. As you can see, everything is starting to take shape now. This is looking really great. Now there is another room that I want to add here with kind of a control room for the ship to be navigated. So for this, I think it can be great if we go again to the prefab corridor and add one of these. So for example, the first one there, we can drag it to the side, rotate it 90 degrees. But here I don't want any ceiling on this one. So instead, I'm going to move this on the other side. And finally, let's take this corridor, duplicate it, put it to the top, rotate it 180 degrees. And instead of a floor, I want to use this as a ceiling. So let's move it like this. And there you go, it's looking great. As you can see, there is kind of a Z fighting here, which is not perceivable by the player. So this is not a problem at the moment. Now, anyway, the last thing I want to do here for all of the main structure of our environment is add another room here. So I'm going to select here this corridor, so the I1, and drag it again in the scene, move it close to the place, rotate it 19 degrees and push it over there. We, of course, want to fill up all of these two space. So for this, an easy way to do so is to select the two windows blocker that we added previously duplicate them and place them at the correct place, like so. Okay, so at this point, there is only one wall to make. And so for this one, I'm going to go in walls again, select here the glass panel and drag it over there. There you go. And finally, we can block here these two view, well, like we did earlier with the two window blocker by duplicating them all and place them next to it. And there you go, just like this, the main structure of our VR environment is made. So as you could see, this was a bit the same as redoing the same step, which is to use some part of the prefab and to move them to their correct position by snapping them with the control key. But of course, you need to think about the gameplay that you want to introduce in your game to create your VR environment. And this is something that I will show you next in a future video. Now, finally, to have something a bit more tied up here, I'm going to create an empty game object and call it our static environment. Beautiful, we can reset its position and drag all of the structural element that we added inside. Now, at this point, feel free to improve the scene as much as you want. In my case, I want to add some props, of course, to make the whole environment feel a bit better. And so what we can do is go again in the modular pack, go to prefab, decorative element. And as you can see, there is a bunch to choose from. For example, there is a shelf that we can put over there. So let's drag it and put it on the side like this. There is this console windows that we can put on the side right there. And I want also to add a desk over there. So I'm going to go to tables and here we have a desk and a desk without computer. So I'm going to select the second one and put it right there. And actually I want to add another desk on the other side. So what we can do is the same, drag here the desk, no computer and put it in front of the window. Beautiful, I think that already with this simple element, the scene looks a bit more alive. You can add anything you want. Now, I think that some element that could already improve this is actually to add some pillar. And we can find them in the column folder here. So let's select here the column end and place them anywhere we want. And there you go, our scene is starting to look great now. But of course, what's missing is to do some proper lighting. But first, what I want to improve is also the skybox, which is not really great. So in my case, 
in the let's make a VR game folder that you should have imported from last episode, you can find in the texture here this 360 Milky Way panorama texture. Now, this is actually a texture that I found on this website. And now the big question is how to turn a panorama into a skybox. And to do so, let's go into material here, right click, create material and call it Milky Way Skybox. Beautiful. Now at the top, instead of the universal render pipeline shader, what we want is search for panoramic. There you go, we can finally go into our texture and drag inside the spherical texture or 360 panorama. Beautiful, as you can see, it seems to work. And now we can drag simply the materials that we created in the scene. And ta-da, as you can see, it is beautiful. Now everything is black, but we will fix that in a few seconds. Of course, feel free to change anything you want. For example, you can change here the rotation to maybe set the beautiful front here of this image behind the desk. You can also change the exposure, but in my case, I think I will leave it like this. Okay, so anyway, I think that everything is a bit dark right now, so why not improve the lighting of our scene? And to do so, we can add some light from the amazing sci-fi asset that we added. So let's go to prefab again then on light, and one of the light that I really like is this one, the light corner blue, which will give a bluish vibe to our game. Let's drag one over there. We can add another one on the side by duplicating it. Beautiful. We can maybe place another one here. There you go. This looks great. With this, we've added some bluish point of light in our game, but I think we could already add another point line in the scene, in quite in the middle, to kind of ambient everything. So to create a light from scratch, let's right click in the Arkly, go to lights and search for point light. We can place it here and maybe add it on the ceiling. Now we cannot see here uh, the light icon because it is disabled here. So let's click on this. And now, as you can see, we should be able to see the range of all of the light. And I think that the icon are a bit too big. So I'm going to simply reduce their 3D. And so here, what we can do is simply increase the intensity of this light and maybe set the color to something a bit more yellowish. Now, for now, this light is not giving any shadow. So we can here in the shadow tab, set it from no shadow to soft shadow. As you can see, everything is looking a bit better like this, but this is not something that is very optimized to do. As there is also some shadow coming from the directional light as well. But don't worry, we will make a complete video about optimizing and publishing this game afterwards. So that's something we should not worry for now, but that we will fix later. Now, it is not worth it that there is some light information that you can also tweak by going to Windows, Rendering, Lighting, and then to Environment. As you can see, you can change here the real-time shadow color or the source environment lighting. So, for example, we can set it to color and kind of change here the different value if you want. In my case, I think I will leave it to this dark gray. And another cool feature is that you can actually have a look at all of the light that you have in your game by going to Windows, Rendering, but this time the Light Explorer. And here it is, we can have a look at all of the blue light that we've added. So if we select them all, they are also selected all in the hierarchy. So for example, you could here increase the intensity if you want. And that's something I'm going to do, but maybe decrease the range to have only the light working on particular point in our scene. And I think it is starting to look really nice. We can also change a bit the color. I think this is working well. And there we go. So feel free here to play with all of the settings of your light to till you find something that you like. But I'm quite pleased with how this is looking right now. So anyway, now let's tidy up everything. So let's select all of the props that we've added and drag them in our static environment. And for all of the light, I'm going to create an empty game object called lighting, reset its position and drag all of the light under it so that we will be able to find them back when we need to. Now we can also improve the visual of our game using post-processing. If you remember, we did them in the previous episode, but we can actually create an empty game object called post-processing volume, add here a volume component. And if I click on new here, add override, post-processing and select bloom, 
we should be able to add a little bit of bloom into the scene, which is quite of nice. So let's select here threshold and intensity and maybe increase the intensity. And as you can see, it is looking really beautiful. I really like the ambience now that we've made. Now, something weird is that apparently the bloom is not working here on the game view, but only on the scene view. So to fix this, you simply need to go to the main camera under the XR origin and here on the post-processing, enable this value. And there it is, as you can see, it is working. Now, another cool thing with the prefab from this package is that, as you can see, they come with some nice colliders that the player will be able to use throughout the game. So it means that we don't need here the plane, which add a mesh collider. So let's select it and press on delete. And now the moment of truth, let's click on play to find out if this works. Okay, and I can see the beautiful environment that we've made and actually the light is kind of reflecting on the hands, which is looking really, really great with all the bloom. But anyway, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but everything feels super big, like you can see from the desk. And so unfortunately, we will need to scale everything down. Now, another technique that we can do to make the VR size of the player works is actually to, instead of scaling the world, scale the players up. But in my case, I don't particularly want to do this because this will, of course, change as well the physics of the object. So it will feel like you, we are holding huge object, which is not that immersive. So if you want to change the size of your environment, you can basically set here the static environment and the lighting scale to something else. And in my case, I found out that a value of dot six works really well. But as you can see, because we've changed the size and not the value of the lighting, the lighting has increased. So what we can do is go back to the lighting explorer from earlier, select here all of the blue point lines, and we can maybe reduce their range and their intensity again, and maybe do this for the main point light as well. And there you go. Everything should be now looking better and feel better with the appropriate size for the player. But let's find out by clicking on play. And there you go. Everything is looking great. Congratulations. We managed to create a beautiful VR environment for our game. Let's make a VR game together. And in this episode, we are going to make the first interaction of our game by being able to grab an object, throw it into a vortex trash can with a custom shader that we will build together, detect when an object enters the trash can, but also disable the hand model when grabbing an object. Okay, now that we've made our beautiful VR environment, let's create some interactable in the scene that the player will be able to grab and interact with, of course, to make everything feels more alive. Now, if we want to grab an object, you should already know how to do this from my tutorial series on how to make a VR game. You basically need two things, a grab interactable and a direct interactor. So first, for the direct interactor, we need to add it under here, the left or the right controller. And we can basically create an empty game object and add the direct interactor component. Or with the new version of the Unity XR Toolkit, there are already some pre-made prefab that we can use. If we go to Samples, XR Interaction Toolkit, Starter Asset, Prefab, Interactor, and there it is, we can drag here the direct interactor under the left controller and the direct interactor under the right controller. Maybe rename the left one left direct interactor and the right one right direct interactor to better differentiate them. And there you go. Now everything should be ready. As you can see, they are using here this sphere collider with a radius of 0.2 to be able to detect an object and grab it. But I think 0.2 is a bit too much. So let's select them both and instead set them to something a bit smaller, like 0.0. .0 Seven? Yeah, this should be good. So now that we have an interactor, we of course need an interactable. So let's see if we go to the sci-fi modular pack, prefab, extended primitive, we have here a beautiful cube. So let's maybe drag it here and scale it down, put it on top of our desk. And let's see if we can grab this cube. Now, as you can see, there is already a box collider on the cube, which is great. 
but what we need is a Xagrab interactable. There you go, you can select and press on enter. And as you can see, it has automatically added a rigid body, which is necessary to move and grab the object. Now already, if we click on play, now already, if we put one of the end through the cube and press on the grip button, as you can see, the cube snaps to the position of the thumb and we can now move and grab it. This is really, really cool. Now, something that I want to improve for this grabbing mechanism is first the snapping. So I don't want the cube to snap on the thumb. I want to keep the initial offset. Before to make this, we had to kind of replace the XR grab interactable with a custom script. But now, as you can see, there is this use dynamic attach parameters that we can enable. And with it, we can keep the initial of that between the interactable and the interactor when we grab it. Let me show you. Okay, here you go. Now let's do the same. Put my hand through the cube and press on the grid button. And as you can see, the initial offset is kept. Everything looks nice. I really think that this looks a bit better. But of course, when you want to snap an object to a good position, the other method using the attach transform is better. And this is something that we will use in the next episode for grabbing a gun, for example. Now, anyway, another issue is that, as you can see, the cube can pass through the table. And this is because the movement of the cube is not using the physics property of the rigid body. So to actually fix this, what we can do is here on the XR grab interactable, set the movement type from instantaneous to velocity tracking. And this should fix the issue. And now if I click on play, as you can see, this is beautiful. The cube does not pass through the table as you can see, but sometimes the movement feels not precise. This is not something that can be seen on video, but yeah, for example, as you can see, sometimes the mesh can pass through the table. So it means that the physics is not properly working on all of the frame. Now there are some settings that we can do to improve the physics. So the first one is to go inside our cube here and on the rigid body, we can set the collision detection not to discrete, but to continuous. And another thing to improve is to go to edit, project settings, then on time. And here the fixed time step is set here to 0.02. Now on PC, this game turns into 90 frames per second. So we can actually change the fixed time step to one divided by 90 which is 0.0111, perfect. Or what we can do is go in the physics tab and here we can increase some of its parameters. For example, the default solver I iteration, we can set it to maybe 15. And in the solver type, we can set it to temporal ghost saddle. And these are, for example, two settings that can improve the physics accuracy of your game. And let me show you if we click on play. Now I can grab the cube. And as you can see, the movement is way more precise. The mesh does not pass through the table anymore and everything is working well. So we successfully improved the physics of our game. Congratulations. But of course, this kind of improvement takes an optimization cost, of course. And that's something that we will discuss later on. But for now, let's keep it this way and let's keep on moving with our interaction in this game. Okay, so now that we have a cube that we can grab, I want maybe to keep this cube and place it on the side. It will be fun for the player to kind of play with the stack of cube if we want. We can even put some on the shelf right there. Beautiful. I think that adding this kind of element that are interactable can really improve the immersion of the player. But now that we can grab an object, I want to use this interaction for one of the first things that the player should do in the game. And that's something that will uh, be understood better in a future episode when the whole picture of the game will be shown to you guys. But basically, the first step that I want the player to do is to take a little rock that falls on his desk and be able to throw it in a trash can. So to do so, let's go to let's make a VR game prefab. And there, as you can see, there is a space waste small that we can drag over there. Beautiful. We can add a component, so a mesh collider, and then add the XR grab interactable to be able to grab this cube. But there is a little issue. And this issue is that mesh collider are not supported for rigid body. It needs to be a convex mesh collider. So we need to enable this here. And as you can see, this has basically made this mesh, well, 
convex, which means that if you take any point inside this object, the line that goes between these two points is contained inside this convex hull. Now, anyway, with this, we should be able to grab this space waste pool. So to throw it into a garbage can, I'm going to select now the trash can that is over there and put it on the side like this. We can maybe increase the size and put it right there. Beautiful. This is a beautiful space trash can. Now, anyway, in this case, I also want to add a mesh collider. There you go. But as we don't want to grab the trash can, we only want to have a good collision with it if we throw a physical object to it. Let's not make it convex. This means that this object will be kind of a physical object which is not moving. Now, anyway, don't forget to maybe change the setting of the XR Grab Interact Table like we did earlier. So for the movement type, velocity tracking. And for the dynamic attach, let's enable it. And now if we click on play, this should not surprise you, but now we can grab and throw this beautiful space rock. Now, anyway, the goal here is to throw it to the trash can. And as you can see, it is working and the collision is working well. Now, while we are at it, I want to improve the look of this trash can by adding a vortex on top. That's a visual effect that we will be able to create with shader graph. And so I feel like there is something kind of exciting that we can do on this project. So let me show you how we can create a little vortex using shader graph. Okay, so to create the vortex effect, now let's right click, go to 3D object and then quad. And let's rename this one Vortex. There you go. We can maybe place it on top of uh, the trash can. Rotate it 90 degrees to make it face upward. There you go. We can maybe scale it down a little bit and place it on top like so. I think it is looking really nice. Now we can remove here the mesh collider. And now we want to create a special effect shader that we want to add on this quad. So for this, let's go here on our asset, right click, go to create, then to shader graph and add on URP a unlit shader graph. We can rename it vortex. And now if we double click on it, as you can see, the shader graph window should appear. And this is where we will be able to create the shader graph for this vortex. And so the particular technique that we want to use is the twirl. So let's right click, go to create node and search for the twirl node. There it is. Now, as the name suggests, this twirl node will create kind of a twirl effect with the particular UVs. You can change here the centers. You can change, of course, here the strengths, for example. And you can maybe even offset it a little bit. Now, I think we can improve uh, the twirl effect with some a little bit of noise. And so the noise that I want to add is a Voro noise. Perfect. We can maybe drag the twirl effect inside the UV. And as you can see, it creates this kind of thing, which is looking great. Again, you can change here maybe the angle offset if you want or the cell density. Now, I think a value of two would be really great. And already, just like this, we can drag it in the base color to see what this looks like. Now, let's click on save and have a look at our trash can. Now, as you can see, we want to change the material of uh, the vortex squad. So an easy way to do so is to select our shader, right click, go to create material. And as you can see, this will create a material and already assign the shader graph vortex to it. So let's simply now drag this new shader on the quad. And as you can see, it is working. But now there are two things that we want to do on the shader graph. Kind of first move it in time and then be able to change its color. So to move the twirl effect in time, what we can do is simply offset the twirl node here. So for this, let's right click, create node and search for time. We could, of course, directly drag here the time inside the offset. But something we can do is also be able to tweak the moving speed of the vortex. So for this, I'm going to create a new node, float, and I'm going to right click and convert it into a property. We can change it to speed. There you go. And then we can create a new node of multiply and multiply this speed by the time so that the bigger the speed, the higher the offset it will apply on the twirl. So now if we save and go back to Unity, there you go, nothing is moving now. But if we go here and increase the speed, as you can see, it is moving, but kind of weirdly. And this is because this effect is not updating every frame. 
And to do so, we can go at the top and click here on Always Refresh. And as you can see, now it is beautiful. We can see this effect into action. It is pretty cool. Now, anyway, to change the color of this offset, we can do a little bit what we've done here for the speed, but with a color node. So let's right click, create a node, search for color. There it is. And we can multiply the Voronoid with the color that we have and feed it to our base color. Beautiful. Now we can right click and turn here this color node into a property that we can kept for the name color. Now if we save, go back to Unity, everything is black. But if we change the color to maybe something green, as you can see, it is looking really nice. And ta-da, just like this, we have created a beautiful vortex effect. Now there is just one last thing that I want to do and it's if we take this vortex effect outside of the trash can, uh, it is not looking nice anymore. So what we can do is actually kind of create a circle mask to kind of fade the edge of this vortex. So let me show you how we can do this by going to vortex, then here on the graph inspector, go to graph setting and for the surface type, set it to transparent. Now, as you can see, we have a new component, which is alpha. And so we will be able to use an alpha mask on this shader. So let's right click, create a node. And for this, search for a sample texture 2D. There it is. And now we can simply set this sample texture in the alpha value. And here for the texture that we want to set, we can set it as a parameter in the shader or automatically set here the default particle which will as you can see fade the quad on the edge because the color is black and as the color is black it will be taken as a maximal transparency value now let's save and have a look at how it is looking in the game and there you go, as you can see, it's looking great, but it's kind of transparent. So this is a bit annoying. Now we can tweak this issue by actually changing kind of the transparency value on the mask. And we can do so by right clicking, creating a float node and multiplying the value of the sample texture by this float before thing linking to the alpha component here. Now let's turn this float into a property that I will call alpha. And now if we save, go back to Unity, it is completely transparent now. But if we increase the alpha value, as you can see, it is now working better. Now, of course, feel free to tweak this shader as much as you'd like. You can, of course, change the alpha mask to have something different. But now we are almost done with the first interaction of our game, which is, if you remember, throw the space waste into the trash can. The only thing that I want to make sure is to check if the player has been able to throw it into the trash can. And for this, I'm going to select here our trash can, right click, go to 3D object capsule. There it is. We can rotate it upward and put it back at the center. Now, I don't want to have a mesh filter or a mesh renderer. I only want to keep here the capsule collider. And what I'm going to do is set the capsule collider to is trigger equals true. And this way, with a script, I will be able to check if an object has reached the inside of the trash can. In our case, it will be the spaced waste. So for this, let's click on add component and add a new component called trigger zone. Now let's double click on this script to open it. Okay, so to check that something as enter, a trigger collider is actually not very complicated. So actually, we can remove here both the start and the update function, and we can check that in the on trigger enter function. Now, with this function, I'm going to create two public variables, a public string target tag and a public unity event. Oh, and for adding a unity event, we actually need to go at the top and add a unity engine dot event namespace. There you go. And so the unity event will take as a parameter a game object. And we can call this unity event on enter event. And now if the tag of this game object is equals to our target tag, it means that we can trigger the on enter event with here the game object that has enter. Beautiful. And so as you can see, this is a very simple script, but that is super handy because it can basically tell you all the time when something, so a rigid body has enter a collider, so a particular zone in the game. 
Okay, so with this trigger zone, we can set a particular tag, which will only make it happen on the object that have this tag. So for example, if we select here our space way small, we can go at the top and set the tag to meteor. Now, if you don't see this tag, you can click on add tag, then on the plus button and write basically any tag that you want. Now, anyway, here I'm going to simply set the space way small to meteor. And what we can do is on the capsule collider on the trigger zone, set the target tag to be meteor. So in the case that the meteor has entered, we can actually disable it. Now to disable the meteor that has reached the inside of the trash can, I'm going to create a new component called trash can. And inside this component, I want to add uh, just one function which will be called inside trash. And that will take as a parameter a game object that we call GO and simply do geo.selective false. So this will simply disable any game object that is inside the trash. And so the last thing we need to do is hook this function to the trigger zone. So we can do so at the start of the game by doing get component trigger zone dot on enter event add listener and add here or inside trash function. And it is as simple as this. Now let's go back to Unity. And if I click on play, there you go. If I put the meteor into the trash can. Perfect. As you can see, it is correctly disabled. Now I know that for now it feels a bit like a lot of work just to disable one game object, but that is something that we will use a lot later on so this trigger zone and most importantly if we want to make the game progress and be sure that the player has succeeded this interaction this trash can component will be very useful now anyway we are almost at the end of this particular part the only thing that i want to show you as a little gift on this tutorial is how to disable the end when grabbing one of these objects now i want to make this because as you can see when i try to grab one of the objects the end is kind of weirdly placed. And so an easy way to fix this is to simply disable the hand. Now, of course, you can do something a bit more precise with it and kind of create a hand grab pose. And I've previously made a tutorial series about this exact feature on my YouTube channel, Valum Tutorials. So feel free to go and watch it if you want to implement it. But in my case, I will simply disable the end that is grabbing the cube. So let me show you how to do this to conclude these tutorials. So if we select, for example, one of the interactable, let's click on add component and create a disable grabbing hand model component. There you go. Let's double click on the script to open it. So on the script, I will need to go at the top and add using unity engine.xr and using unity engine.xr.interaction.toolkit. Then we will need two variables a public reference game object to the left hand model, and you guessed it, a public game object reference on the right hand model. Beautiful. But now there are two questions. How can we detect when an object is grabbed? And how can we detect which end is grabbing the object? So for the first question, what we can do is actually in the start, get the XR grab interactable called grab interactable with get component of type XR grab interactable. And then to know when the object is grabbed or not, we can do grab interactable dot select entered dot add listener. So this means that we will fire any function that we put into these parentheses when this object is grabbed. So the two functions that we want to use is a public void hide grabbing hand and a public void show grabbing hand. There you go. Now we can, for example, add the hide grabbing hand into the select enter add listener. But as you can see, there is an error because the hide grabbing hand function needs to have a parameter of type select enter args. So we can simply fix this by creating these parameters and call it args and do the same, but this time with a select exit even args. Perfect. So make sure here to set select enter and select exit. And so for the other, we can do the same with select exit it dot add listener show grabbing hand. Beautiful. So this way we are able to know when a player has grabbed or released an object. But now, of course, we need to know which end is grabbing the object. And the easiest technique to do so is to compare the tag of the end grabbing the object. 
So for this, in the hide grabbing hand, for example, we can do if args.interactor object dot transform dot tag equals left hand. And if the tag of the interactor is left hand, we can then hide the left hand model. Now, else if the tag of the grabbing end is not the left end, but the right end. I guess you see me coming with this one. We can simply set the right end model to false. And there you go. This is how we can simply check which end is grabbing the object. Now we can simply copy all of these lines, put them in the show grabbing end, and instead of false here, write true. Beautiful. And there you go. Just like this, I think our script is ready. We can save and go back to Unity. Now, the last thing we would want to do is simply go to our left terminator hand that we added in the first episode and add it as the left hand model and do the same for the right hand model. Beautiful. Now, the last thing we want to do is make sure that the left hand and the right hand tag are set properly. To do so, we can go at the top and set here the left controller to, to the left hand tag. So let's click on add tag, click on plus and create a left and tag there you go we can already create maybe the right hand tag as well and we can simply now set the left controller tag for left hand and the right controller tag to right hand but now if we click on play let's see if this works and as you can see it doesn't the ends keep showing and the reason is actually that we've set the tag on the left controller and the right controller but not on the interactor which is, as you can see, the value that is used inside our script. So there is two ways to fix this. You can actually check the parent tag on the script, or an easier way is to simply go into the left direct interactor and set this game object to be the left hand tag and the right direct interactor to be the right hand tag. And there you go. Now this way, the interactor as well as the controller will be correctly set to the good tag. Now let's try this by clicking on play. And there you go, as you can see, it is working. My hands correctly disappear when I grab the object, which feel a little bit more immersive because the end is no more really place. And as you can see, this works really great even if I'm kind of switching ends while grabbing the object. Let's make a VR game together. And in this new episode, we are going to make a pistol that we can grab and use to break objects into little pieces. Okay, so let's work on the gun for our game. So if we go to the let's make a VR game folder that you should have while installing the Unity package that I've sent you on the first episode, you should go to then prefab and see here this beautiful sci-fi pistol now we can drag it in the scene. There it is. Now again, as the same for the meteor, we want to be able to grab this sci-fi pistol. Now, as you can see, there are already some colliders in the children. So what's left is to go on its parent and add a XR grab interactable. Now, as always, this has also added a rigid body, but this is very important. As the collider are not inside the same game object of the XR grab interactable, you need to add them here in the colliders list. So we can simply drag here the base and finally the handle. And there is the two box collider that will be used to grab this pistol. Now, remember that by default, we are with the XR grab interactable, we can snap the object into a particular position on your end. Now, of course, you can tweak this particular position. And so in the case of this gun, what we can do is right click, create an empty called attach transform, and we can drag this attach transform here on the attach transform parameters of the XR grab interactable. Now let's click on play to see how this looks. Okay, so here you go. As you can see, when I grab the pistol, well, it snaps, but it's not the good position. So an easy fix is actually to while we play, you can unmaximize the windows and you can change here the attach transform position to what you want. Now, strangely, with previous version of the uh, Unity XR Interaction Toolkit, you could kind of update it uh, right away, you know, so change here the position and it would change the position of the gun directly. But I don't know why it's not working anymore. So basically, the only technique that works is like you need to kind of release and regrab the gun kind of quickly to make it work. But I mean, it's working. Now here you can play with the setting as much as you want. And I think I found something that I feel looks good. So now that it is ready, we can simply right click, copy, 
component, leave play mode, and pass the component back to the attached transform. And now, if I click on play, the gun always snap to the correct position on the right hand. And as you can see, it apparently does not work on the left hand. Now, that's something that we actually fixed in my tutorial series on how to make a VR game. And I will just leave a link to you for the people who want to fix the attached transform issue on the left end by making your own XR grab interactable to attach transform component. But a fix that we can do is actually set here the X value on the attached transform to zero. And basically with this, the attached transform will work on both ends as well, but will be restricted on the X position. And there you go. As you can see, the position is now correct on both and is kind of looking great. So that's nice. Well, the end is always not positioned very well on this gun. So what we can do is maybe improve this by adding the disabling end component that we added on the rock earlier in the previous episode. So let's go at the top and add a disable grabbing hand model. We can then uh, drag here our left terminator hand for the left hand and our right terminator hand for the right hand. And there you go. Now it should disable the hand grabbing the pistol. Okay, next we of course want to be able to fire something with this gun. Now to do so, let's click on add component and create another component called Meteor Pistol, which will handle this job. Okay, so remember when we add the disable grabbing hand model, we just had to basically know when we grab or release an object. And now this will be a bit the same, but not when we grab or release, when we activate the object. That's right. So let's go at the top and add using unityengine.xr first, and then using unityengine.xr.interaction.toolkit. Perfect. Now at the start, let's add a grab interactable with XR grab interactable grab interactable equals get component of type XR grab interactable. Beautiful. And now we can do grab interactable dot activated dot add listener. So this is when the interactable is activated. So this means when we, you grab the object and that you press on the activation button, which is automatically set to the trigger button. Now, anyway, when we activate it, we can also set an event for the grab interactable deactivate it. There you go. And so I'm going to create two functions to hook them to these two events. So a start shoot function and a public void stop shoot function. Beautiful. Now, again, we can add them over there, but we will have a little error because these two functions does not have a particular argument that the listener needs to have. But you can actually take that this function has it by simply writing in front x little arrow to the right and parenthesis. There you go. Okay, so in my case, I simply want to play a certain particles when the player activate the gun. So for this, I'm going to go at the top and add a public particle system called particles. And when we start shooting, I want to do particles that play. But when we stop shooting, we want to do particles dot stop. There you go. Now doing simply particle dot stop will not work because we also want to stop emitting and clear all of the particles that are in the air. And we can do so with true particle system stop behavior dot stop emitting and clear. So this will really stop every particle that are in the air and make sure that all of them disappear. OK, here you go. Now we can save and go back to Unity. Of course, what's missing is the particles that you will be able to find in the prefab folder under the Let's Make a VR Game. And here they are. We can drag them in the scene. And as you can see, these are some beautiful red circle particles, which I made in preparation of these tutorials. And yeah, I'm quite happy of how they look. Now, anyway, we can drag them under the sci-fi pistol. We can maybe reset its position and try to make the top ear came out of this position. There you go. It looks nice. You can, of course, change the size of this by changing the size of the object. As you can see, you can make them go a bit less far with this setting right there. But I think they look just great like this. So anyway, now let's save, go to our Meteor Pistol. And what I want to do is drag the particle system that we added over there. Oh, and something important is that we want this particle to not play at the start. So make sure here to have here the play on awake disable, but it should be the case by default. Now, anyway, let's click on play to see if this works. 
Okay, here we go. So first thing first, you can see that if I grab the end, my end disappear. But now what happens if I press on the trigger button? And ta-da, as you can see, it is working. This is beautiful. We have successfully managed to activate the particle and stop them correctly. I really like this effect a lot. But now is the next big part of this tutorial's because we have now a gun that can snap to our hands. We are able to activate it, but we want to use this activation to break a big rock. So the first thing we want to do is, of course, be able to break something. And the second thing is to trigger this break behavior with the gun. Now, to break something, we want to go to the prefab. And then, as you can see, there is a space waste breakable that we can drag here, which is basically a bigger rock than the other. Now, we want to be able to grab this rock, so I'm going to add a mesh collider set it to convex, add the XR grab interactable. We can again send the movement type to velocity tracking. I'm going also to select the previous rock, copy the disable grabbing hand model, and paste it on this game object as well. Beautiful. But now, as you can see, as a children of the space waste breakable, there are four elements. And these are four elements that are basically the same model of their parents, but just part of it. So it's just the same rock, but break into pieces. So basically, the idea now is to kind of fake the break of this object by simply disabling the parent and enabling all of the children. Oh, and by the way, something that we can do beforehand is, of course, be able also to grab the broken part of the space waste. So I'm going to select them all, click on Add Component, Mesh Collider, Convex, XR grab interactable, velocity tracking, and use dynamic attach. There you go, we can also pass the disable grabbing hand model component. Okay, phew, now let's go to its parent and create the famous breakable component by clicking on add component, breakable, and open the script in Visual Studio. Okay, so to disable the parent and enable the children, it's not really complicated. We can simply create a public list of game object, which I will call breakable pieces. There you go. And at the start, we can make sure to disable them all. So we can browse this list. And for each of the item inside the breakable pieces, do item.selective. False. Perfect. And now I'm going to create a new public void function called break. Now inside this function, we can do basically uh, the opposite of this. So a for each loop on our breakable pieces. But this time do item.selective true. And finally, we want also to set the parent to false. So let's do game object set active false here. But there is quite of a little issue doing this because all of these breakable pieces are a child of, well, a parent that we disable. Well, they will be disabled as well. So we can actually fix this by setting the parent of all of the pieces to null. So to do so, we can simply do item.transform.parent equal null. Now, this is really great. And there you go, that's basically it. We can now save and go back to Unity. And there you go. Now, what's left is to drag all of the breakable pieces there. An easy way to do so is to lock the windows, select all the part and drag there over there. We can then unlock the window again and go back to the breakable. And now to trigger this breakable function with our pistol, we can reopen the meteor pistol component. And we will need to use a raycast to be able to trigger the break function. So to do so, I'm going to add a bunch of variables at the top. First, a layer mask, which will be the layer that will be used for our raycast. Finally, we want to add a shoot source, which will be the starting point of the raycast. A public float called distance, which will be the maximum distance of our raycast. And there you go. Now I'm going to create down below a new void function called raycast check. Beautiful. Now inside this raycast check function, we can do raycast hit and call the physics.raycast function, which will go at the start of the shoot source position in the shoot source.forward direction and which will have as a output the raycast hit that is called hit. And finally, the two last parameters are the distance and the layer mask. Beautiful. Now we can check that we have hit something by simply writing bool as it in front of the physics recast. And if we have hit something, we can actually trigger the break function with, with hit.transform.gameobject 
send message break. So here make sure that the break string value is the same as the break function name. Now anyway, the last parameter we want is to set that we don't require a reserver with this send message. So let's do send message option dot don't require reserver. And there you go. The only thing we need is to, of course, do the raycast check. So we can add it simply in the update function. But there is an issue with this is that we only want to check the raycast when the player is activating the particle system. So to fix this, I'm going to add at the top a private bool called reactivate and set it initially to false. And what we can do is set the ray activate to true when we start shooting and to false when we stop shooting. And now if ray activate, we can do the ray cast check. Beautiful. Now let's save and go back to Unity. And now here is the moment of truth. Let's see if we can break this big meteor with the firing of the gun. Okay, but of course, before testing our game, we need to set up the shoot source here and of course, the layer mask. Now for the layer mask, we can set it to basically everything. But for the shoot force, so the starting point of the ray, we can right click under the sci-fi pistol, create empty, rename it shoot source and kind of place it on the end of the gun like so. This looks great. And now we can simply drag it as the shoot source of the meteor pistol. Just like this, everything should be ready. Let's see if we can break this big rock into pieces with our gun. Okay, so for now, I can still grab the gun. I can fire the particle system, but now let's point it at the rock. And wow, as you can see, it is working and it has correctly break the rock into little pieces. And what's really fun is that you can actually keep on grabbing all of the little pieces and kind of throw them to the garbage can as well. So now everything is working well, congratulations. But there is something more that I want to do. The first thing is that, as you can see, there was a little issue with the material of one of the pieces, which is the energy pieces. So let me just right click in the asset, create material, call this energy, and maybe just set it to a blue color and even increase the emission to blue. We can then drag this new energy material into the missing material of this little cube. I hope this will fix it and we can have a better look at it. It looks great. And now anyway, the second thing that I want to fix is that it was, I felt like uh, this big rug was kind of bricked too easily. So a thing that we can do is actually check a couple of frame to know if we can break something. To do so, I'm going to select here this rock and we can do this very easily. We can add at the top a public float called time to break and set it to maybe two seconds and add a private float timer. And basically, when we call the break function, we can kind of increase the timer with time dot delta time. And if the timer is bigger than the time to break, then it is at this moment that we can call the rest of the function to break into pieces the big bug. Okay, so now let's save and click on play. And now let's see if it takes more time to break the rock. Okay, so I can still grab the pistol. I can still shoot on both ends. And if I press it on the rock for more than two seconds, it works perfectly. So congratulations. And as you can see, all the pieces are still interactable. So we've managed to finish the shooting pistol mechanism. Let's make a VR game together and in this new episode we are going to learn how we can let the player move freely in our VR world with continuous movement, turn and teleportation. Okay, so here we are where we were left at the end of last episode. So if you remember, in the previous video we were able to destroy this meteoroid with the gun over there and what this has made is spawn this little energy cube. And so, spoiler alert, one of the next interactions that we will be able to make is to analyze this little cube by moving it uh, somewhere else in the scene right there. But unfortunately, to go from this point where the player is currently to another place in the scene, it is a bit far for the player to simply walk. So what we can do is, of course, use one of VR main locomotion system. So let me just press on Ctrl Z to re-disable this energy. 
And anyway, now we have two main locomotion system in VR. We have continuous movement and teleportation. And now what I'm going to do in this video is show you a setup that makes them both work with the same VR rig. And so first, let's start with the continuous movement, which is the simplest to do. And so to enable any locomotion in your game, we need to search for here a locomotion system that we can add. Now, as you can see, it needs an XR origin, so we can basically drag this component over there. Now it's time to enable the continuous movement. So for this, let's click on Add Component and search for Dynamic Move Provider. Now, as you can see, it needs a locomotion system that we added earlier, so let's drag it over there. And now you can see a bunch of settings that the Dynamic Move Provider is using to, well, move the player. We have here the movement speed to say at which velocity the player is moving. Now, I believe that one is plenty enough. Enable strap is to make the player move left or right. Here we have gravity application mode, which is set currently to attempting move, which means that gravity will only apply when we are trying to move. Now, personally, what I like to do is set it not to attempting move, but to immediately, which will mean that gravity is always happening on the player at any given time. Okay, so for the forward source, this is the direction in which the player is moving. So the big thing, in my opinion, is to go here and select main camera and to set the main camera direction to be the forward source. There you go. Now here we will be able to set the input action that will set the input to enable the dynamic movement. So what we can do is click here on use reference and then here and search for move. And as you can see, we have here directly the XRI left hand locomotion move. Now if we double click on this action, here is the list of our action. And as you can see, if we go down below, we can have a look at the action that is assigned for the move input action, which is, in our case, the primary to the axis, so the left thumbstick. So, of course, if you want to use another action to move the player, you can do so here. But I think that by default, it is pretty great to have the left thumb thing working for this movement. Now, anyway, we could also do the same for the right hand, but I particularly like to uh, reserve the right hand to rotate and the left hand to move with the joystick. Now, anyway, we can also set here the head transform as well as the left and right controller. So let's drag here the main camera for the head transform, the left controller for the left controller and the right controller for the right controller. And everything is now set up on the dynamic move providers. But to enable continuous movement, we of course need a character controller. So let's click on add component, search for character controller and here it is. Now, basically what this component is, it is a capsule collider, which is making it possible to kind of move stairs, move slope and kind of better handle the movement of the character. As you can see, for example, you have here the slope limit. So 45 degrees in my case, which means that any slope above this angle will not be able to be passed by the player. Here, the step offset means that any step that is higher than 0.3 will be considered as a wall. And anyway, the uh, parameters that interest us in our case is here the radius. As you can see, the radius is a bit big in our case, as it is 0.5. So let's set it instead to 0.1. Perfect. Now for the height, let's set it to 1. And for the center, let's set it to 0.5 on the Y axis. And as you can see, this will make it so that the start of the character controller will begin here at the ground. So at the starting position of the XR origin, which is what we want. Now, anyway, Everything is now ready. Let's see if this works by clicking on play. Okay, so here we are, guys. I'm in VR and now I can move my hands and everything. But let's try to press on the left thumbsticks to see if we move. And as you can see, it is working. I can now move in all directions simply by setting the direction in which I want to move with the thumbstick. So it is working well. And now, of course, you can tweak the settings and maybe change the speed of the movement to something higher or lower, depending on what you are trying to achieve. But something that I want to fix is that if here I unmaximize these windows and that I select here all player, as you can see, the capsule collider is always following the center of the play area. But unfortunately, if the players move left to right, the capsule does not work. Which means that, for example, if I go near a wall right there and that I move my head inside, 
as you can see, I can pass it. Now, only the uh, way to fix this is to actually update here the center of the capsule collider on the character controller to follow the head. And so let's leave play mode to fix this. And here in the XR origin, we are going to search for the character controller driver. We can set the dynamic move provider here. There you go. And as you can see, we have a min height and a max height which will be able to set here the maximum height that the capsule collider can have. But without further ado, let me click on play to show you what this component does. Okay, and here you go. Now I think that this is pretty straightforward. As you can see now, even if I move my head left or right, the capsule collider follow exactly the position of my body and keeps updating to take into action the movement of my head. For example, if I try to get lower, it will update the height of the character controller. And the same goes when I try to stand up anyway. And this means that we will have a better and more precise collision with our world by moving around. So for example, if I go to the side here, as you can see, I cannot pass with my head the wall like it was the case before. Okay, so this concludes the continuous movement. So now, of course, the next question is, how can we use something similar not to move, but to turn? And so we have two ways of doing this. We have the continuous turn and the snap turn, which basically does the same, but instead of doing a continuous movement, will turn the player directly to a certain amount of degrees, like a quarter of turn, for example. Now, these are basically really easy to set up. So for example, for the continuous turn, let's click on add component and search for continuous turn provider action based. There it is. We can drag the locomotion system again here. There is the turn speed over there and we can set the input action like earlier. So in my case, I want to click on use reference here and search on right turn and there it is we have the right hand locomotion turn and now as you can see if i go to the input action you can see that this use the right touchpad on the right controller now anyway you can do something similar for the snap turn by adding not a continuous turn provider but a snap turn provider there it is Again, let's drag the locomotion system here. We have the turn amount, which has the rotation degree that will be applied to rotate the players. And we can set again the same input action by going here and do snap turn on the right hand. There you go. And now basically you can choose which turn type you want to add for a player, continuous or snap. In my case, so this is just a personal preference. I just prefer to use the continuous turn provider. I don't know why. So in my case, I will simply disable this one. But you can, of course, let the player choose which turn system he wants to use in a menu. And that's something that we can, of course, talk a little bit later in this tutorial series. Now, anyway, let me click on play to find out if we can, of course, turn with the right touchpad. And there you go, as you can see, in a matter of a few seconds, we are now able to move around our beautiful scene and even turn with both joysticks. This is really great. And just to give you kind of an example on the other turn method, if I go now to the X origin and disable the continuous to enable the snap, now there you go, I should be able to rotate a quarter of a turn every time that I press on the touchpad. And as you can see, this is working well as well. Okay, so at this point, we learn about continuous movement and about turning. So of course, the next logic step is to learn the second big locomotion system, which is the teleportation. So for the teleportation, like we did for the dynamic move provider, we need to go to the XR origin and click on add component. And here I'm going to add a teleportation provider. There you go. Now, as you can see, it needs a reference to the locomotion system that we can find above. So let's drag it over there. But now there are two things missing for our teleportation. We need a ray to point to where we want to teleport and we want to have a teleport destination. Now for the teleport ray, we could make it like we did for here, the right direct interactor, but instead it will be a right ray interactor. But lucky for us, if we go to samples, XR interaction, the version that we have, and then to prefab interactor, we can see here directly a teleport interactor already set up for us that we will be able to drag under the right controller. But before doing this, now, if we go to the interaction layer mask, as you can see right now, there is no layer mask set 
for the XR Ray Interactor, which means that it will not be able to interact with anything. And that's something that we can fix by simply going here, add layer and add a teleport layer. Now, by default, the XR Interaction Toolkit really likes you to put a teleport layer here on the 31 used layer. And you can actually find this if we go to edit, project settings, then on XR plugin management, project validation. As you can see, if you have not set the 31 layer to be teleport, you will have this warning here asking you to do so. So we can, of course, simply write teleport here or here if I click on fix and wait a little bit. As you can see, it does this automatically. And now if I close these windows, go back to the interactor, teleport interactor prefab. As you can see now, the interaction layer mask is set to teleport. So perfect. Now we can simply drag it under the right controller. And I'm going to rename it right teleport interactor. There you go. Now let's click on play to find out what this looks like. Okay, here you go. So apparently it is working because we now have a red ray coming out of our right hand. But of course the ray is red because there is no teleport destination that we can point to. So let's see how we can fix this. Okay, so there are basically two teleport destinations that we can make. The teleportation anchor and the teleportation area. Now the teleportation anchor is the first one that we are going to make and this one actually force a certain position and direction when you are teleported to, which is not the case for the teleportation area, which are large area that you can teleport. Now anyway, again, we can find a prefab for the teleportation area by going to sample XR interaction toolkit, but this time on prefab, go to teleport. And there it is. We have here the teleport anchor that we can drag somewhere in our game. For example, here looks nice. And now let's click on play to see what this looks like. And there you go. This exactly shows what I told you about just a minute ago. Now we have a valid zone that we can point to. And as you can see, it directly set a certain direction on my left right there. And now if we want to teleport, we simply need to press on the select button, which is in our case, the grip button on the right controller. So let's do so. And there you go. Now, as you can see, it has currently teleported me to this position and made me look at this direction. But in the case of my game, I don't want to use a teleport anchor because I want the player to freely be able to move here and be able to teleport anywhere on the ground. So what I'm going to do is simply disable here the teleport anchor. You can, of course, use it in your game. But personally, what I'm going to do is add a teleport area. So to do so, what we can do is right click here, create empty and create a teleport area. We can reset here the position and add as a component the teleport area. There you go. So the only thing that we want to set up on this component is, of course, the interaction layer mask that needs to be set to teleport as well. And we can set it before to nothing, then to teleport to only have the teleport layer mask here. And now the last thing is to, of course, set the colliders that we can teleport to. Now, in the case of this game, there are three colliders that we can teleport. There is the collider on this ground, on this ground, and finally on this ground, which are here all located under static environment and which are the three floor two that we have and here the floor five. So what we can do is simply drag here the floor two to the colliders list. And as you can see, it has added here. Do this with the second floor that we have. And there you go. Now with this, we have the three floor collider that are listed in the collider list of our teleportation area. And so this means that the three collider will be potentially be used to teleport to. But of course, let's find out if this works by clicking on play. And there you go. As you can see, it seems to work because now I can point to any floor position that I want. And if I press on the grip button, it correctly teleports me to the good position. But now I want to improve here this teleportation system in two ways. The first one is that, as you can see, there is a certain reticle here that points to a certain direction. And actually, what could be great is to be able to control the direction that we want to be teleported to using the thumbstick. Finally, what I want is not be able to teleport using the grip button, but simply by pointing the thumbstick forward 
And so let's see how we can tweak the input action for teleportation to be able to do all of this. Okay, so to be able to control the direction in which we want to teleport to, what we need is simply to go in our teleport area and here on the teleportation configuration, you need to enable the match directional input. By doing so, now if we click on play, as you can see, if we press on the grip button, but keep it pressed, and that at, in the same time we use the thumbstick, as you can see, we can set here a certain direction that we want to be teleported to. So for example, I can point in the direction of this shelf and I will be directly teleported in front of it, which I think can be pretty useful. But what is annoying now is that we are using the grip button to teleport, which is not that good because we want to use the grip button not to teleport, but to grab object. So to override the input action, what we can do is go to our right teleport interactor and simply add a Nixar controller action base. Now by default, the XR ray interactor that is used to teleport, if there is no XR controller on this game object, he will use the one on the parent, which is this one right there. Now this one right there is using all the action that are seen over there. So to sum up the grip button to select and the trigger button to activate and to simply overwrite, what we can do is use here this new XR control that we made. We can set it up like the other one. So like the right controller, but what we can do is not use any position, rotation and track movement. So I'm going to disable them all because we don't want this game object to move. And finally, replace here the select action. And so to do so, I'm going to click here and search for teleport. And as you can see, by default, we already have a teleport select that we can enable. And I'm going to set this input action as well on the select action value. So let's click again here, search for teleport and set the right and teleport select over there. And there you go. This way, this will overwrite the input action that is used on the X-Array interactor to teleport. Oh, and by default, if you wonder what this teleport select action is used with, if we double click on it, as you can see, what it is using is actually here the primary to the axis on the right hand. So basically the right touchpad. Okay, and here you go. Now, as you can see this work, we can now use the touchpad to teleport. But as you can see, there is a little bit of an annoying thing is that there is now a controller prefab on the right end, which is not that hard to fix. But which is annoying is that we also are using the right touchpad to rotate. So basically, we have one action that is used to two different things. So let me show you how we can fix this. So first for the controller, we can simply go under the right teleport interactor. And here for the model prefab, we can click here and set it to none. Perfect. Okay, and now for the issue that we have with the right teleport interactor, which is set on the same input action as the rotate, let me show you a fix that is amazing and will prevent any overlap with the teleportation. Now, I guess by now you are starting to understand how annoying the teleportation can be if not done properly. And I think that this solution, which is now possible with the latest version of the Unity XR Toolkit, does a pretty good job at making it work really well. Now, for this particular solution, what we want to do is go on the right controller parent. And at the top, I'm going to add a Nixar interaction group. There you go. So on the XR interaction group, I'm going to click on plus two times and drag there or right teleport interactor for the first one and the right direct interactor for the second one. But what is this XR interaction group? Now, this is a great component that was made recently by Unity. And basically the purpose of this component is to make sure that only one interactor at a time can interact on this group. So by doing the setup that we made, which is adding both the teleport interactor and the right direct interactor, it will not make it possible for the player to hold an object and be able to teleport as well at the same time, which is something that I think can help prevent a lot of bugs. But that's not it. 
Now, the other component that we are going to add is an action-based controller manager. Now, as you can see, there are plenty of things to add on this game object. And this action-based controller manager is basically a component that will be able to better handle the interaction on the Ray controller. For example, it will only show the Ray when we are pressing on the Ray activation button and it will block all of the other locomotion at the same time. So anyway, to set up the action-based controller manager, we want to drag the XR interaction group over there. The direct interactor, we can drag here or right direct interactor. As you can see, there is a setting for a ray interactor, which we don't have currently in our game right now. So let's skip it. And let's drag here the right teleport interactor for the teleport interactor. Now, there is a bunch of input action that we can add here. So for the teleport mode activate, let's click here and search for teleport activate and set it to be the right hand teleport activate. Do the same for teleport cancel with the right hand teleport cancel. For the turn, we can add the right turn. For the snap turn, the right snap turn. For the move, the right move. And finally, for the UI scroll, we can search for scroll and set it to the right hand UI scroll. And beautiful, now everything is set up. There is only one thing that we can look. As you can see, there is a setting to set the locomotion settings that we want to use on the XR controller. So basically, is the XR controller using a smooth motion or a smooth turn? And in our case, we want to use a smooth turn. So let's enable it over there. And there you go. This way, everything should be now set up. And this should make the teleportation and the turning work separately and also only shows the teleportation when we press on the activation button. But one way to find out, and it is to click on play. And there you go. Now, as you can see, first thing first, there is no ray coming out of my right hand right now. I can still move with the left joystick and rotate with the right joystick. But when I point the right joystick forward, as you can see, I now have a ray showing and I can then point a certain direction that I want to teleport to. And if I release the right joystick, I am indeed teleported to the good direction. So now everything is working. And with both having the continuous movement and the teleportation working at the same time, which I think really works great. And this means that we have now succeeded to make the locomotion system of our game work. Let's make a VR game together and in this new episode we are going to analyze the energy cube using a socket interactor. Then be able to restrict it to a certain tag and add a poke interaction to open or close a door by the push of a button. Okay, so remember in a previous video we did this interaction where we could break this little box into pieces and so what this created is made this energy cube appears but now my goal is to be able to analyze this energy cube somewhere else in the seed now that we can move around using the awesome locomotion system that we made earlier. But anyway, to be able to analyze this cube I'm going to use the socket interactor. So the big question is how can we use a socket interactor? And now, in my case, what I'm going to do is go in the sci-fi style modular pack that we have. Then if I go to prefab, machine, we have here a bunch of machine that we can choose from. And I think I'm going to drag this projector to in the scene. Okay, it is kind of big right now. So let's press on R and scale it down a little bit. And I'm going to move it near here, right there. I think it looks good. And we can maybe increase it on the Y axis. Perfect, so this is the place where the player will be able to analyze the cube. So what I want is the player to uh, like of drop the cube on top of here, this little thing, and be able to snap the cube right in place. Now to use a socket interactor to do so, it is really simple. What we can do is right click, create empty, call this socket interactor, there you go. Click then on add component and add here the XR socket interactor. Now, a XR socket interactor basically works like a direct interactor, which we are using on the right controller to be able to grab object. But this one actually don't need any XR controller. It will basically try to grab anything at any given time. And what we can use is another mesh material to kind of show the object before it is stuck to a certain place. So what I'm going to do is right click on the project folders, create materials, call this one socket preview. 
we can go at the top to universal render pipeline unlit and i'm going to set it not to opaque but to transparent drag the color to be something a bit uh, yellowish and we can maybe reduce the alpha value to make it transparent beautiful now let's drag this socket preview inside the over mesh material perfect and now believe it or not but after clicking on add component adding a sphere collider that we can set to maybe 0.1 on the radius and make it trigger it is done we have finished with the socket interactor setup so as you can see very simple now of course i want to place kind of the projector at this place right there and we could do so by dragging the socket interactor as a child of the projector but what i don't really like is that the projector has a scale which is a bit weird right now and I found out that it is best to actually set the socket interactor as a child of a parent which has a scale of 1, 1, 1. So what I'm going to do is right click on the projector and click on create empty parent. Now, as you can see, this has created a parent on the projector, which is located at the same place, but which has a scale of 1, 1, 1. We can call this one energy analyzer. There you go. And now we can drag the socket interactor under this energy analyzer. We can then set the position to 0, 0, 0 so that it is located at the same place. And we can maybe increase the socket interactor right there. Now, looking back, I think that we've made a mistake with the radius. I don't know why I set it so small. So let's maybe set it to 0.1 instead of 0 0.01. And as you can see, it is now looking a bit better. And there you go. Now let's see if this works by clicking on play. Okay, so let's grab our cube here and let's try to place it on top of the analyzer. And as you can see, this is really cool. When I approach the cube, it is showing me a little over preview with the yellow transparent material that we made earlier. And when I release the grip button, Ta-da! As you can see, it snaps directly the cube into place. And as you can see, this works really great. But right now, we have still a big problem. Because at the moment, this can work with the cube like we intend to. But this works as well for any grabbable object that we made. Now, as you can see, we can do the same and snap it to place as well. And that's something that maybe you want in your game. But in my case, I only want the player to be able to snap the energy cube because otherwise this would create a lot of gameplay problem. So for example, the player will be able to cheat to go to the last step of the game by simply dragging the first meteor to this place right there before having to kind of break the big meteor and show the, the blue cube. Now, anyway, to restrict the socket interactor, we could basically go in the interaction layer mask and create a particular layer, but I think that there is a better way to do so. And this method is to override the XR socket interactor with a XR socket tag interactor. That's right. So let's remove this XR socket interactor and instead let's create a new component that I will call XR socket tag interactor. Now let's open this script in Visual Studio. Okay, so as the name suggests, the goal of this script is to basically do the same as the XR socket interactor, but only restrict the socket to a certain tag. Now to do so, we need to add at the top using Unity Engine.xr.interaction.toolkit. And instead of mono behavior, we want to override the XR socket interactor. This means that now everything that is in the XR socket interactor is inside the XR socket tag interactor as well. But now we are able to override some of the function. Now, in my case, I'm going to add a public string called target tag. We can remove both the start and the update function. And the function that we want to override is the can over. So let's write override. And as you can see, there is a list of everything that we can override, which is kind of long. But anyway, what we want to override is here, this can over with the XR over interactable. There you go. Now, by default, it will return the base can over function. And so the last thing that we can do is simply check that the interactable has the target tag with and interactable the transform the tag equals target tag. Beautiful. Now, last but not least, let's do this not to over, but to select with public override can select. There it is. 
and do exactly the same. So I'm simply going to copy and paste here this last element on the line and everything is already done. Just like this, we've successfully managed to override the XR socket interactor to make it work with only one particular tag. So let's save and go back to Unity. Okay, so as before, let's set up here the over mesh material with the socket preview that we added. There you go. And as you can see, the target tag is right there. So what we can do is go maybe to our energy cube, which is under the space with breakable right there. This is the one. And as you can see, the tag was set to meteor, which is not what we want. Let's click on add tag plus and create a tag called energy. Beautiful. Now let's go back to the energy game object and set it to its good energy tag. Then go to the socket interactor and for the target tag, let's set it to energy. Beautiful. Now, if we click on play, let's find out if only the cube can be snapped to this position. Okay, so here you go. As you can see, I can still approach the blue cube and snap it to the good place. But when doing the same with the meteor, it does not work. So this means that we successfully managed to create a socket interactor which only works with a given tag. So congratulations. But now it is time to go to the next interaction because now that we've placed this energy cube to the socket interactor, what we want is be able to push a button to open this door. So let me show you how we can do this. Okay, so first thing first, to make a button with the latest XR Interaction Toolkit, it is very simple. And actually, if we go to the sample XR Interaction Toolkit, and again to the prefab list, if we go to the UI 3D, as you can see, you will be able to find here a push button, which you can directly use. And this is what I'm going to do on this project. So for this, I'm going to right click, go to 3D object and create a cube and scale it down like this. I'm going to place it right there and I think it will be better to change its material. So I'm going to create a new material called white. And by default, as you can see, the color is white. So there is nothing to do more on this material except to drag it to the cube that we made. And there it is, our beautiful white material. Now, anyway, let's drag here the push button in our scene. There it is. So right now we could drag here the push button under the cube that we made earlier. But in the same way as for the projector, because the cube has not a scale of 1, 1, 1, this is not really great. So instead, I'm going to right click, create empty parent, call this button stand. Beautiful. We can call now the white cube to stand and drag the push button under the button stand and reset its position. Now we simply need to drag it up like this. And there you go. Now our button stand is finished and is correctly placed. And as you can see, I think it looks really, really great. So now let's find out if this button is working by clicking on play. Okay, so I'm in front of the button, but as you can see, even if the color change when I try to over it, nothing happens and I cannot push it down. And this is because we don't have any interactor to do so. Right now we have the direct and the teleportation interactor, but if we want to poke a button, we need to add a poke interactor. And this is what we are going to make right now. Okay, so to make a poke interactor, it is really simple. We need to go to the XR origin and under the right controller, let's right click, create empty and call this one right poke interactor. There you go. We can then click on add component and add here an XR port interactor. There you go. Now, as you can see, the only thing that needs to be set up on the XR poke interactor is the attach transform, which will be used for the default position to poke with any object. Now, in my case, I want this attach transform to be the top of the index finger. So what we can do is go under the right terminator end and under the bones, we have here the pointer and we can simply drag on the attach transform the last bone on the index finger. So this bone right there, we can simply drag it here. And there you go. Now everything is set up. What we can do now is do the same, but not on the right controller, but on the left one. So let's duplicate this game object, drag it under the left controller, rename it left poke interactor and do the same, which is go in the bones of the left hand, go under the pointer and drag the last bone on the left 
and for the attach transform. Beautiful, now everything is already set up and just like this, we should be able to interact with this button. So let's click on play to find out if this works. And there you go, if I go near this button and that I use my index finger to try to push it, as you can see, it correctly goes down and push the button correctly. And as you can see, this works with two ends. It is really, really cool. Now, anyway, just to give you a little example of how this works, as you can see, this push button is simply using the XR simple interactable, which is the simplest form of an interactable with the XR interaction toolkit. But it uses here the XR poke filter to give the direction in which the button can move. So as you can see, the direction that is used is the negative Y axis. And anyway, to respond to the interaction of the player, the push button is using the XR poke follow affordance. Now, this is a bit more advanced, but the affordance system is a new system also made by Unity to kind of give some visual and audio feedback to the interaction of the player. Now, I've previously made a tutorial about it that you can watch over there. So if you want to learn more about the affordance system, go on and watch it. The link is in the description. And by the way, as you can see, there is also a color affordance system that is added to this button, which is the thing that is making this red part change color when we are interacting with it. And we will see later how to use this to actually give some sound effect when interacting with an object. But anyway, now that we are able to push a button, we of course want to use this to open this door right there. So let's see how we can do this. Okay, so to be able to open the door, if we select the door, as you can see, there is an animator on the door, which has an animator controller called Frame Door. Now, if we go to Windows, Animation, Animator, as you can see, this show us here the animator, which is responsible to handle all of the animation. And now if we go to the parameters, we can see that there is a Boolean called character nearby that is used to open the door. I guess that by default, the person that made the asset wanted to check if the player was nearby to open the door, which is kind of logical. And as you can see, it is the case because by default, the door is closed. But if the character nearby is set to true, it will then open the door and only if the character nearby is set to false, it will then close the door and go back to the initial state. Now, anyway, what I'm going to do is just to be a bit more self-explanatory, rename this character nearby by open. There you go. And as you can see, by default, this has already renamed the condition as well. And what I want to do is be able to change these open parameters in our script when the button is pushed. So to do so, let's go to our push button. I'm going to click on add component and we can add a component called button push open door. There you go. So this script will be really simple. At the top, we simply need to add the using unity engine.xr.interaction.toolkit that you already know. And now we need two things. Of course, we need a public animator called animator and a public string bool name, which we can already set to open and is the boolean name which is used inside the animator. Now, anyway, at the start of the game, we can get access to the XR simple interactable, which is used on the button and on the select enter, we can add a new listener to open or close the door. So for this, I'm going to add a new function called toggle door open. There you go. And what this does is actually get the current state of uh, the door with bool is open equals animator dot get bool, then give our bool name, and then set the boolean to be the opposite of the is open value with animator dot set bool, bool name, and for the opposite of is open, we can simply write not is open. Beautiful. And so the last thing we need to do is hook this function inside the add listener. Now, if we simply copy this function and paste it over there, as you can see, it gives us an error because the select enters needs to have a parameter of type select enter even args. But as you already know, we can fix this by writing x little arrow to the right and calling directly the toggle open door like this. Beautiful. And now no more error and everything should work fine. We can remove the update function, save our script and go back to Unity.
Okay, beautiful. Now, last thing is to set the animator on the animator component to be the door animator. So let's lock the inspector. Click here to highlight the door too and drag it here on the animator. Beautiful. We can now unlock the windows. And now by doing this, we should be able to open or close the door by simply pushing the button. So let's see how this works by clicking on play. Okay, here it is, the moment of truth. Let's try to push this button. And as you can see, it works beautifully. The door has now opened. And what's even cooler is that if I push the button again, it closed the door. Now, as you can see, this is super satisfying. Now, anyway, there is just one last issue that I want to fix with you is that, of course, we can now trigger the select event by pushing the button down. But right now, if we move our hands near the button and that we press on the grip button, as you can see, it also closed the button. Now, this is because with the XR Simple Interactable, we can trigger the select enter event with the poke, but also currently with the direct interactor. Now, if we want to remove this behavior, it's actually not that complicated. What we can do is go on our push button. And now in the XR Simple Interactable, if we go to the interaction layer mask, as you can see, the interaction layer mask is set to be default. What we can do is go to add layer and add a new layer called poke. Now let's go back to our push button, set the interaction layer mask to nothing and then to only poke. And finally, we need to go to the XR origin, right and left controller. We can select them both. And for the interaction layer mask, set them to nothing poke so that the interaction will only works with the interactable that have the poke layer mask. And now if we click on play, let's find out if we have managed to resolve this bug. Okay, I can still push the button, but now if I try to grab it, as you can see, it does not work anymore, so everything is working correctly. Congratulations, with this, we managed to create the two next interaction of our game, which is be able to analyze here this little energy cube with a socket interactor, and then open or close this door with the button. Let's make a VR game together. And in this new episode, we are going to add a ladder to climb to the control room and then be able to move the spaceship by grabbing a wheel and a lever. Okay, so for our next amazing interaction, what you want to do is to be able to control the spaceship. But first, we need to go to the control room, which is over there. And as you can see, there is a big problem is that it's on another level. But worry no more because we are going to make our own ladder to be able to reach this point. Now for the ladder, we need to make, of course, the climbing system. Now I've previously made a video about how to climb in VR, which is a bit old right now. But what is pretty cool is that the XR Interaction Toolkit has updated their SDK with a new climbing system. That's right. So for example, if we go to samples, XR Interaction Toolkit, Starter asset, prefab, there is, as you can see, a climb folder that we can open with a climbing wall and a ladder. Amazing, right? So what we can do is simply drag here this ladder right there. Let's move it to the side. And actually, this ladder is going a bit too high right now. So an easy fix is to simply put it down. Now, in my case, the player will never go outside to see here uh, the ladder going outside of the ship. So this is not a problem. So how does this ladder work? As you can see, we have a left side right there, which basically does nothing. And a right side, which like the left side is doing nothing. But the important part are here, these handles. Now, as you can see, these handles have a climb interactable, which is in the same way as the teleportation that we made earlier, is working kind of a teleportation area, but for the climbing. Next, as you can see, there is also a top handle, which is basically two bar with another climb interactable. But the question is, why is there two types of climb interactable? Now, as you can see, this is because if we go to the setting override, the two climbable only differs here with the climb setting override. With the handles, you can basically only go up, 
but with the top handles, you will be able to go up, but also move on the forward axis. And the purpose of basically these top handles is to be able to kind of place yourself more easily on this platform right there, which was not the case. So right now we have with this ladder everything already set up for us. Now you can of course use the climb interactable on any game object with a collider to be able to climb on it. And the last thing that we need is to go on the XR origin and click on add component and search for climb provider. Then we can basically drag the locomotion system over there in the system and it's done. With it, everything is set up to be able to use this ladder and climb on top of it to reach here the control room. Now let's find out how this works by clicking on play. Okay, here you go. Let's try to move and we can open the door and here is the beautiful ladder. And as you can see, if I approach my hands, it changed the color of the ladder using the affordance system, which was the same as for the button, if you remember. And now if I press on the grip button, as you can see, I can move up or down. And when I release, I'm able to jump out of the ladder. Okay, and as you can see, if I grab one handle at a time, I'm able to climb on top of the ladder. And now with the top handles, I can just move myself up outside of the ladder because as you remember, with the top of the ladder, I can not only move up, but also forward. And then as you can see, I successfully managed to reach the control room this way. Awesome. Okay, but now that we have managed to go inside the control room and that we can do so by climbing the ladder, we want to be able to control the spaceship here on this desk. Now, the first thing that I want to fix is that I think that this window is a bit too much opaque. So I'm going to select it, go to Windows here on the material, and for the blending mode, set it to Alpha. There you go. We can maybe click on the color and kind of reduce the alpha value here to be able to see a bit better and like this everything should work great. Now to control the spaceship I'm going to add two things, a lever and a wheel. Now again these two things used to be some complicated setup to do on your project but lucky for us again the Unity XR Interaction Toolkit has already set up an awesome wheel and an awesome lever in their sample project which is really odd to me is that it is not by default inside the Unity XR Interaction Toolkit package that we install here. So as you can see, if we go to the prefab and to the UI 3D, we cannot see the wheel, neither the lever here. So to save us some time, I've already added them inside the Let's Make a VR Game folder that you should have installed in the first episode of this series. So if we go to Let's Make a VR Game, then to UI 3D, examples, then to UI 3D, prefab, you should see all of them here. So we have this wheel, a slider, a push button, a lever, a joystick, a grip button, and a dial. Now anyway, what we need in my case is a wheel, so I'm simply going to drag it over there like this, and a lever that I can drag on the side like this. Now for the wheel, I think that we can scale it up a little bit and rotate it this way. Beautiful. For the lever, we can do the same. Beautiful, and it already looks good. Now, by default, the value of the lever is enabled, but in my case, I want the lever to be off at start, so let's disable it. And as you can see, it has correctly placed the lever on the other side, so let's maybe rotate it 180 degrees to retrieve its original position. Beautiful. Now let's see how this works by clicking on play. Now as you can see I'm already in front of the wheel and the lever and as you can see they works really really great. Now these two elements works by simply overriding the XR grab interactable but restricting their movement around a certain axis. But now using this wheel and this lever the question is how can we control the spaceship? And as you can see, we have a certain value here, which is already set at 0.5 by default. And that goes from 0 to 1. And for the lever, as you saw earlier, we have here the value that can change its rotation as well. 
Now, using these two values, so the rotation value on the wheel and the on-off value on the lever is not complicated to do. What is a bit weird is that if we want to control the speed shift, it will mean that we need to move everything to a certain direction, which is something we don't want, of course, because it will create all sorts of problems, like collision, but also on the optimization, which we will talk about later in this series. But I have another trick up my sleeve to fix this. Because instead of moving the speed ship in itself, what if we move the outside environment to fake to the player that we are actually moving? And this is what we are going to make. So if we go to our let's make a VR game prefab, we have here our space waste small, and I'm going to place some outside of our environment just in front of the control room. We can press on R and scale it up a little bit like this. There you go. Now, as you can see, I've added a bunch of space with ball meteor outside of our environment. And my goal is for the player to navigate his way through them and to reach a certain point. Now, I have found out that maybe a good idea would be to reuse the awesome vortex effect that we've made. So what I'm going to do is duplicate it. Oh, as <laughs> This is getting weird here, but anyway, let's drag it outside of the interactable next to the space way small and let's place it over there. Beautiful. We can rotate it 90 degrees to make it face our spaceship. And my goal is to make it just in front of here, the spaceship and to scale it up like so. Beautiful. There you go. Now this way, we've already managed to set up the outside world for our amazing VR environment. And so, in my case, the goal for the player will be to reach this big vortex in time and not touch any of the asteroids. And he will be able to navigate using the wheel and the lever that we added earlier. Now, like I mentioned earlier, instead of moving the whole environment, the only thing that we can do is move here all of the outside world to make it feel like the player is moving. So for this, let's right click, create empty call this one space outside and recenter its position. And let's drag all of our outside element under the space outside so that they are only controlled by one object. Now to be able to control this space outside using the two value from our wheel and from our lover, let's create a new component that I'm going to call space outside controller. Now in this script, we are going to need a reference to our wheel and to our lover that we can get with using unity engine.xr.content.interaction. Now at the top, we can add a public XR lover called lover and a public XR knob called knob. Beautiful. Then I'm going to add two floats, a public float for the forward speed, which will be called forward speed, <laughs> and a public float for the side speed called side speed. Amazing. And now in the update function, let's use these two value with the lever and the knob for the movement on the forward axis. What we can do is forward velocity and set it to the forward speed. But we only want the forward speed to apply if the lever is on. So what we can do is actually multiply by lever dot value interrogation one double point zero. Now, basically, if you don't know already, this is like asking a question. Is the lever dot value on? If it's the case, we will set this to one. If it's not the case, we'll set it to zero. So basically, when the lever dot value is false, this will just set all of the thing to zero. Otherwise, it will set it to the forward speed. Now let's do the same for the side velocity. We can do so by side velocity multiply by the same thing. So lever dot value one or zero, uh, side speed, sorry. But in the case of the side velocity, we also want to take into consideration the rotation of the wheel. Now, if you remember, if we go to our wheel right there, we add the value that went from zero to one, zero meaning left, one meaning right, but multiply by mathf.lerp minus one, one, and then knob.value. Beautiful. Now, by adding the matherf.lerp, this means that when the knob value is set to zero, it will return the value minus one. 
When the knob value is set to 1, it will return 1. And when the knob value is in the middle, which is 0 0.5, it will return the middle of minus 1 and 1, which is 0. So this will give us a correct value that goes from left to right and that we can use to move our space outside by creating a vector 3 called velocity that we can set with new vector 3 side velocity 0 forward velocity. And then let's finally do transform dot position plus equals to velocity multiply by time dot delta time to apply correctly the velocity that we made. And so with these beautiful settings, what we made is move the space outside in this direction when the lever is on. And when the wheel is on the left side, we will move everything to the left and on the right side, everything to the right. Make it feel like the player is actually controlling the spaceship. Now, anyway, we have two things to set up here, the lever and the knob. So let's set it here by clicking here on lever and then knob by clicking here on wheel. Now for the forward speed, let's maybe set it to three meters per second and for the side speed to one meter per second. And now let's find out if this works by clicking on play. Let's see if I enable this lever, if we can move forward and if we turn the wheel, if we can go left or right. So here you go. And it seems to work. As you can see, I can move left or right and I can even maybe stop the spaceship. Now this effect is working great. I guess that it's really hard to see that it's not the spaceship that is moving, but all of the outside. Now I really like this effect and I hope that it will give you plenty of ID for your VR game as well. And this sums up the awesome interaction that we wanted to make here with the climbing and with the control of the spaceship with these two elements. Let's make a VR game together and in this new episode we are going to make our game come to life by adding a narrative story using a timeline. Grab and use the disintegrator. Okay, so now at this point here are the interactions that I want the player to perform in order. 1. Grab and throw the small asteroid in the trash can. 2. Break the big asteroid with the gun. 3. Analyze the energy cube. 4 open the door and go to the control room and finally five navigate the spaceship to the vortex and in this episode we'll make our game come to life by adding a meaning to all of these interactions with a story and some narration so before recording these tutorials i wrote this little text you can pause if you want to read the complete story then i generated from this text eight voice line and as you can see, I've already imported this 8 voice line in this game. And of course, you will be able to download them as well and add it to your own project with the link you will find in the description. Now, anyway, the big question is, how can we link the narration with the action of our game? And for this project, I'm going to share with you my little secret on how to do so with a timeline. So let me show you. Now, a timeline is basically like doing a video editing. Now, if we go to Windows, Package Manager, then go in Project, you should see by default the timeline already imported in the project. Otherwise, you can search for them in the Unity registry and add them like we've done previously on this series. Now, anyway, to add a timeline to our game, let's right click, create an empty game object that we can rename Narrative story there we go we can recenter this empty game object and add a playable director there you go now we can go to windows sequencing and here we should see timeline it should add this timeline windows that i like to drag next to the game windows and as you can see it is asking us to add a timeline i said so let's click on create we can keep the narrative story timeline name and click on save and there you go, now our timeline is already set up. So in my case, I'm going to drag the first voice line over there. And by default, as you can see, this has already added a timeline element, which is of type audio source here, and that will be able to play the first voice line. As you can see, if I select the first frame and press on play. Day 117, we are still stuck in this space void. According to our calculations, the food reserves will allow you to survive for another 15 hours. Good luck. 
And here it is, you should be able to add the first timeline. So let's add the other. Okay, so now that we have all the voice lines that are representing uh, the different step of our game over there, the really cool thing that we can do with the timeline is to also enable or disable some object. Just to show you a quick example, in the first part of the story, I want here the little asteroid to spawn. Now, what we can do is enable the first asteroid to show it to the player after the first voice line is played. And we can also do the same with the big asteroid afterwards. To do so, I'm going to uh, just to navigate more easily, lock the timeline windows. We can then select our space waste small right there. And we can simply drag it over there on this left side of the timeline and select add activation track. Now, as the name suggests, an activation track will make sure that the space with mode is activated within here the time that is shown. So you can take a side and kind of drag it to where you want the object to start appearing. Or on the other end, you can drag this other side to kind of make the object disappear. Now, in my case, I want the activation of the space with mode to go from the third voice line and go all the way here till the start of the fourth voice line. Now this will make sure that as you can see, if I change here the timeline, this will make sure that the asteroid will only show when the voice line here is played and it will disappear when the next voice line here will get started. Now anyway, we can do the same for the big asteroid. So we can drag here the space with breakable in the left side again, add activation. And there you go, we can do the same. So here in my case, I'm making sure that the space with breakable is spawning at the correct time for the voice assistant number four here that we have and will disappear when we start the next voice line. Now, a next thing that is really cool with the timeline is that you can actually trigger some action as well from the timeline. So for example, in my case, I want the button to be pushable here and to open the door only after we have snapped the energy cube on the socket interactor over there. And according to my timeline, this is happening on the sixth voice line. Congratulations, you found a new energy source. According to my calculation, that's enough to power the beer cooler or restart the engines, your choice. Doors unlocked. And so to do so, we can right click here and click on signal track. There you go. And then right click again and add signal emitter. Now, as you can see, we need to create a signal. So let's click on create signal and I'm going to call it door unlock. Beautiful. But as you can see, the track has no bound game object. So the bound game object is basically a game object in your scene that will have a signal reserver component. Now, in my case, I want here the push button to have this. So let's add a component and add the signal reserver component. We can add as the reaction, select here the door unlocked, and we can then drag the signal reserver over there. Now the last step is to say what happens when the door is unlocked. And in my case, I'm going to click here on the plus button. We can then drag the push button over there and then go to the button push open door and then enable equals true. And there you go. Now if we disable the button push open door function, this will make sure that the script that is responsible to open the door on the push of this button will happen only when this signal has emitted in our timeline. Okay, so, so far we've seen three things with the timeline, how to add audio, how to enable or disable object, and how to trigger custom function from this timeline. But another cool thing is that you can also animate an object from the timeline. And let me show you how. So for example, here, I have here the vortex. And one thing that could be cool is that only when the players enters this zone, the vortex will scale up. And in my case, I want to do this kind of behavior over there. So let's hear it. Reach the space teleportator ahead. As you forgot to use the plasma molecular magnetic chocolate shield, avoid the asteroid or you will die. Okay, so to animate any object within the timeline, what we can do is drag the object in question, which is the vortex here on the left, and add an animation track. There we go. So in my case, I want the animation to start over there at the start of the voice line. And then what we can do is click here on the record button. And in my case, I'm going to scale down this vortex to zero, zero, zero. 
and then go a little further into the timeline. And here we can set the new scale of the vortex, which was eight on all axis, I believe. And there we go now, if we right click and convert to clip track, and then finally uh, end the recording, we should have a beautiful animation for our vortex to scale up. Reach the space teleportator ahead. And there you go. Now we've seen a, a lot of, of different behavior that we can do with the timeline. And what's even fascinating is that you can see all of this behavior at any point within just one Unity Windows, which I think is really cool because you can basically have a direct understanding of all the components and all of the story within your game in the same way that you would in a video editing software. But of course, right now, all of the, the story of our game is not linked to the interaction of the player. So for example, if we just click on play, as you can see by default, the unit timeline will play, but it will not stop and not wait for the player to perform a certain action, which is what we want, of course. So before I forget, I want these two asteroids to not just spawn from somewhere. So a little technique that I'm going to do is select the trash can. We can press on Ctrl D to duplicate it. And there it is. We can then go to the capsule and simply delete it. And I'm going to call this one Space Vacuum. Beautiful. And move the duplicate trash can over there at the middle of the desk. I'm going to then rotate it 180 degrees like so and put it to the top right there. There you go. And now what we can do is put the two asteroids inside here, uh, the space vacuum, so that when they will be instantiated by here or timeline, they will drop in front of the players on top of the desk. So let me just grab this one and put it over there. Okay, here you go. So now the big question is, how can we make it so that the timeline will not play automatically till the end and that will wait for the player's input. And to do so, the first step is to stop the timeline. And the technique that we will use is to simply use another signal emitter on the timeline to just pause it. So you should know how to do this. Let's right click, signal track, then go to our narrative story. We can then add a signal reserver, beautiful. We can then go here on the signal reserver and create a new signal, which I will call stop timeline. Beautiful. We can then drag the signal receiver over there. And for the reaction, I'm going to click on the plus button, then navigate to the no function here, playable director, and then pause. Beautiful. And finally, the last thing we need to do is to simply stop the timeline when we want to wait for a player's interaction. So for example, over there, after the end of the third voice line, I want the player to grab the meteor and to put it in the trash can. So let's right click, add a signal emitter. We can drag it at the end of the voice line. And for the emit signal, let's select the stop timeline. Beautiful. Now we can simply copy the timeline and paste it on the others. And so our next interaction is to use the gun on the big asteroid. So let's simply copy here the stop timeline and paste it at the end over there. Beautiful. Now the next stop timeline is after here, the fifth one, which is when we are analyzing the cube. Now the next one is when uh, the players reach uh, the control room. So I can put it at the end over there of the sixth voice line. And finally, the last one is when the players manage to navigate the spaceship to the space teleporter over there. So let's place it at the end of the seventh. And there you go. Now, as you can see, we have here the five timeline stopper that will stop playing the timeline and wait for the player's interaction. Now, of course, if we click on play, let's see if it stops correctly. We go to our timeline, select something before the timeline stopper and then press on play. Scrap. Throw it into the quantum black hole interstellar trash can on the left. As you can see, it works. By default, it has automatically paused the timeline. So now the last step that we need to do is to play the timeline back once the player has done a particular interaction. So let's see how we can do this. Okay, so to do so, I'm going to select the narrative story game object that we made earlier. I'm going to create a new component that we can call play steps. Beautiful. 
Now, as the name suggests, the goal of this component will be to create a couple of steps and that we'll be able to trigger at any time. Now, this step will correspond to a certain action and a certain time on the timeline that we have. So let's go at the top and add using Unity Engine dot playables. Beautiful. Now that we have this namespace, we can add a playable director called director, and we can get it at the start of the game with director equals get component of type playable director. There you go. Now let's create a custom class here inside this play step function that will be able to hold all of the data in a steps. To do so, let's create a public class, step, and inside this class, I want three things. A public string called name, which will be the name of the step that we are using to identify it better. Then a public float called time, and finally a public bool called as played equals false. There you go. Now we can go at the top and add a public list of steps that we can call steps. Now, if we save and go back to Unity, as you can see, we cannot see any steps here and we cannot uh, set them up in uh, the Unity Inspector. And this is because we need to go at the top of the step class and add system.serializable. There you go. Now, if we go back to Unity once again, there it is. We can see the step game object. And as you can see, you will be able to add all of the steps information here. But anyway, now let's finish with our script. If we can remove the, here the update function, and instead I'm going to add a public void called play step index that will take as a parameter a int index. Now with this parameter, we should be able to get the target step with steps and get the corresponding steps index. Now we should make sure that the steps has not played yet, and if it has not played yet. We can set the step that has played to true. We can then stop the director with director.stop, set the director time to be the step that time, and then automatically play the director with director.play. Now, by doing so, as you can see, we'll make sure that the steps only play once with the has played here, and then we will be able to set the timeline at a particular time, which is the time of the step that we want to trigger, and then play automatically the director after that. Now everything is done, we can save and go back to Unity. Now is the time to set up all of the steps of our game. Now, if you remember, we have five of them that we can see on the timeline. So let's add three new over there. The first one is the throw in trash. The second one is the break meteor with gun. The third one is to analyze the cube. The next one is to go to control room. And the final one is to navigate to the space teleporter with the spaceship. Now for the time, this is the time that should be set on the timeline after the action is performed. So if we look at the throw in trash, it should begin at the start of the fourth voice line, which is this value. So let's copy it, go back to the narrative story and paste it over there. Now for the brick meteor with gun, the, the voice line after this action is this one, which is 52 over there. For the analyze of the cube, the start of the time is this one. So let's paste it. To go to the control room is this time frame. So let's paste it again. And finally, after we navigate the space teleporter, it is the outro timeline, which is this one right there. And that we can paste as well at the end. And beautiful, everything is now done. The last thing we need is to hook and call a play steps based on the action that the players perform. So let's do this with the first interaction, which is throw the asteroid in the trash can. Now, if you remember, under our trash can, we have this capsule, which has a trigger zone. And remember, I told you that this script will be important in the future, and the future has come because we are going to use it. Now, when the meteors enter the trash can, what we can simply do is click on the plus button, drag our narrative story, and select the play steps index. And here, set the play step index to be zero, which means that we should successfully manage to finish these steps. Now, the next step was to break the meteor. So if we go back to the meteor, 
which is the space with breakable. We can add here a custom action by going inside a breakable script. So at the top, let's add using unity engine.events and let's add a public unity event call on break. Okay, once we've created the unity event for the break, we can simply go under here the break function. And just before setting the game object to false, let's do on break dot invoke. There you go. Okay, beautiful. Now we can save and go back to Unity to just set up the Unity event for the on break. There you go. We can go back now to Unity, click on the plus button, drag our narrative story, then go to the play steps, play steps index and select the play steps index one. Beautiful. Now the next step was to analyze the energy cube. So let's select here our energy analyzer. And on the socket interactor, we can go to the interactor events. And on the select enter, click on the plus button. Then we can drag again on narrative story, play step index and write to beautiful. Okay, so the next step is a bit more complicated. It is enabling here the door to open and then going upwards here to the control room. But how should we know that the players has entered the control room? Now to do so, we can use the trigger zone component that we made earlier. So if we right click, go to 3D object and cube, this will create a 3D cube. As you can see, we can scale it up like so. There you go and make it fit the size of our control room. We can remove the mesh renderer and the mesh filter as we only want to have here the box collider. Beautiful. Now this seems to fit well. Next step is to add the trigger zone component that we made in the second episode of this tutorial series. It was a long time ago, I know. Now anyway, this component needs a trigger collider so we can set the box collider to be its trigger and it needs a particular target tag. Now remember that on the XR origin, we have a collider that is hidden within the character controller. As you can see, this is a capsule collider that will follow the player and that we can use to know if the player has entered a trigger zone. So what we can do is set here the player to a certain tag now, as you can see, I've already have a player tag, which I can set. Otherwise, you can create the player tag by, by clicking on add tag. And now what's left is to go to the cube, set the target tag to be the player. We can also rename this cube control room trigger the zone. And finally, we can do the same as before, which is click on play, drag the narrative story, then go to play steps, play steps index and we want the index to be the third one. But if we keep it this way, it will not work. Because if you are using a trigger zone, which use a trigger collider to have the trigger event worked, one of the two game objects needs to have a rigid body. But unfortunately, if we go to our XR origin, it has no rigid body. And I don't want to add any rigid body to the XR origin as it can create some weird physical bug. So anyway, what we can do is simply select our control room, click on add component and add here our rigid body. And as it will basically be on trigger box collider, it will do nothing and never move. So don't worry about any weird collision with it. And finally, the last thing we need to do is to make sure that the spaceship has entered the space vortex that we can see if we go a bit further into the timeline right there. So to do so, I'm going to do the same as the control room. So we can simply duplicate the control room trigger zone and rename it space teleporter trigger zone. We can instead of the third index write four here, we can then move here this space teleporter trigger zone near our vortex over there. We can even maybe reshape it a bit better. There we go. Now this way we will be able to know when the players has entered this zone, which means that he will be able to navigate the spaceship all the way to the vortex. Okay, guys, and something dumb that I noticed is that uh, I forgot here to uncheck the use gravity for the rigid body, which if I click on play, which as you can see, make the trigger zone fall uh, indefinitely. So what we can do is simply select the one that is under the space outside as well, and to simply make sure that use gravity is set to false. Now, anyway, let's click on play to test our awesome game. Day 117, we are still stuck in this space void. 
According to our calculations, the food reserves will allow you to survive for another 15 hours. Good luck. Attention, a new arrival of space matter has been caught by the slurp system. That's just some space scrap. Throw it into the quantum black hole interstellar trash can on the left. Attention, new arrival of space matter. This one is too big for the quantum black hole interstellar trash can. Grab and use the disintegrator. What's this sparkling anomaly? Interesting, we need further informations. Place it into the Doom Nuclear Void Spectrum Analyzer. Congratulations, you've found a new energy source. According to my calculation, that's enough to power the beer cooler or restart the engines, your choice. Doors unlocked. And there you go guys, our narrative story is now working with the timeline. Our timeline is playing the voice line and then waits for the player's action. This is crazy to me to see how everything comes to life now and the result is just mind-blowing. Now we are almost at the end, two more episodes to go Let's make a VR game together and in this new episode we are going to add a start menu to our game. Okay so here we are where we were left at the end of last episode but now to make a start menu I'm going to use an awesome asset which is free for everybody and which is made by an awesome VR developer called Valem Tutorials. So if you are not aware I've previously released a project called the VR Game Jam template which is like a template for you to use for any uh, VR game and which contains a start scene like this with a start button, an option button, an about and a quit and with here the game title. So why not use it for our own let's make a VR game project? Oh, and of course, this project is available, as I told you, for everybody, and you can directly download it from this GitHub page. Okay, so once it is downloaded, you can basically go in the start scene and right click, go then to export package, and you should see all of what this scene contains. We have the audio that we want, we have some fonts, some materials. Here for the plugins, as I already have uh, the Oculus Ends installed on the Let's Make a VR game project, let's uncheck it for the prefab we can then uncheck the same for the samples which are already present in the other project we can keep the script we can then remove the xri example which i've already implemented and we can simply click here on export to export it as a unity package and once that's done you should have a unity package containing everything to set up a starting that we should be able to drag in our project so let's simply take it and drag it over there in the project files. And as you can see, we can have a look at everything that it's contained and we can click on import. Now to save you some time, instead of downloading the whole GitHub project and exporting the package yourself, I will leave in the description below a direct download link to this package for you to make sure that everything is working. And as you can see, I have a warning, but no error, which means that there is no issues after downloading this package and we can get started on our start scene so if we go to scene, there it is, we can see here our start scene. We have still our sample scene, which is the scene that we currently have here opened. So let's simply rename the sample scene by to spaceship scene. Beautiful. And now if we double click on the start scene, there you go, we can see it and we can then click on import TMP essentials. This is for the text mesh pro. So as you can see, there is a little bug. We cannot see here the text on the button, but don't worry, simply close and reopen the project and it should be fixed. And there you go, after closing and reopening the project, as you can see, we are able to see the text for all of the button. That's perfect. But now let's set up this start scene for our project. The first thing we want is to add this, this scene in the build settings. For this, let's go to file, Build settings, we can see here our spaceship scene. So let's simply drag our start scene over there and make sure that the start scene is above here, the spaceship scene. 
This way, when we build our game, the first thing that will be launched is the start scene. Okay, so now that we are in the start scene, let's click on the game title and let's rename here the game title by the title of our game, which is Space Scrapper. Now the font is a bit too big, so let's maybe reduce it. We can tweak uh, this uh, UI as we want. So for example, let's change here the color to blue like this. Now, another thing that I'm going to change is the skybox. So if you remember, we have another skybox that is used in the spaceship scene and which is the Milky Way that we can find in Let's Make a VR Game Materials. And here it is, Milky Way skybox. So let's drag it instead. There you go. It is beautiful. Now for the ground here, let's maybe change the color of the ground, not to gray, but directly to black. And let's change the blending mode to alpha. This will add more opacity on the ground, which I think looks great. But as you can see, with the change of opacity from the ground, we kind of have an issue here with the transparent layer. So a technique that we can do is simply go on the game menu ground here. And for the sorting priority, we can reduce it to minus one. And as you can see, everything works now. The UI shows in front of the ground. Okay, now let's try this menu directly. So let's click on play to find out if this still works. Okay, so as you can see, everything seems to work. I am here in VR, I have some VR ends and I can point array to the UI. So for example, if I click on option, I can see some option to control the volume of the game. And if I go to about, oh, here, it is a bit weird because the UI is dark and it's not saying the correct thing. So we will be able to change this later on. Now we have the quit button, which will be able to quit the game once we build it, of course. But now if I click on start, as you can see, I fade. And I currently jump into the next scene. That's awesome. So right now with what we've tested, we know that everything is working great, which is a good news. The thing that I can change is going here under the about. Then on text, we can change here the little text. I'm going to change its color to white. And as you can see, this will allow us to kind of better see here the text when it's showing. Now we can change the inside of this text. Mine is, this game was made by Valem Tutorials for the Let's Make a VR Game series. Don't forget to like and subscribe. There you go. Now we can just uncheck the about and show the main menu over there like it was the case before. And there we go. Now at this point, we have a functioning start menu that we can play at the start of the game to be able to go to the main spaceship scene. But of course, something that we want to do is go back to the start scene once the game is finished. So let me show you how we can do this. Okay, so to go back to the start scene, once we finish the game in the spaceship scene, we need two things. The scene transition manager here, that is able to transition the player to one scene to another. And finally here, if I go under the XR origin, we have the fader screen, which is able, as the name suggests, to fade the screen. So what I'm going to do is go to our spaceship scene right there. I'm going then to go to prefab, and you should see here the transition manager that we can drag in the scene. Beautiful. As you can see, it needs here the fading screen from the fader screen. So let's go under our XR origin, locate our main camera and drag the fader screen under the main camera. Now for the fading to works, make sure here that the position Z value, so 0 0.015, is bigger here than the clipping near plane which is the case here as the near clipping plane value is at 0 0.01. So 0 0.015 is higher. Now, as you can see by default, we can fade the screen when we start the game, which is really nice. So for example, if I click on play, you should see the screen go from black to transparent. Beautiful. Day now in my case, I'm simply going to set the fade duration a bit quicker, like one, for example. And now the last thing that we need to do is, of course, to call this scene transition when we finish the game. But with the awesome timeline system that we've made, it is very easy to do. So if we go to our narrative story and that we open back the timeline manager by going to sequence right there, we can call here the scene transition with a signal like we have done for the different part of our storyline. 
So I'm going to right click, add a signal track, then select our transition manager. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to assign the fade screen. So let's do this now that we've added the fader screen before. Okay, so to add a signal receiver, let's add component, add a signal receiver. We can click on add reaction, then create signal and call the signal end of game. Beautiful. For this signal, we can then click on plus, drag our scene transition manager, and then go to scene transition manager, go to scene async. Now here, the index that you can put is the index of the build index of this scene. Now, if we go to file, build settings, you can see that the start scene build index is at zero and that the spaceship scene is at one. So make sure to set it to zero here to be able to go directly to the start scene. Now, if we go back to our timeline, we can drag the transition manager on the signal receiver, right click, go to add signal emitter and select for the emit signal, the end of game. And now you can place this anywhere you want. In my case, I'm going to place it a bit before the end of the voice line because there is a fading screen that will occur before we switch the scene. So it will be perfectly timed if we just place it just a few seconds before. Now, if you have multiple scenes, you can, of course, tweak here the transition to go to any index scene that you want. Now, anyway, let's go back to our game windows, click on maximize and then click on play. Okay, guys, I'm almost at the end of the game. So I just finish playing all of the sequence. Now let's see if I reach the teleporter ahead, if I'm able to directly automatically go back to the start scene. Let's see. And there you go. Congratulations, that did not work. Energy empty. Looks like we are stuck again. Maybe you should have used it for the beer cooler. Aha aha. And beautiful, as you can see, it worked. We have successfully fade to the starting scene. That's amazing. And now we can still see all of the option, validate. We can, by the way, see the new about that we've created earlier. And if we click on start again, we are ready to jump again in the game. That's Day awesome. 117, we are still stuck in this space void. And there you go, guys. As you can see, with the VR template, we were able to quickly set up a nice little start menu for our game, which turned out super cool. Let's make a VR game together and in this new episode, we are going to add some music and some sound effect to our game. Okay, so as you can see before recording these tutorials, I've added five different audio for my game. One that is a background audio, one for the spaceship engine, one for the gun, one for when we start to grab an object and one when the doors open. So let me just drag them inside our project under here, the audio folders. Okay, now I'm going to show you two ways of quickly be able to link one of these audios to the interaction of your game. And the first one is using the affordance system. So for example, if I take this cube and that we want to add a certain audio when we want to grab it, an easy way is to simply right click, create an empty game object, call it audio affordance and then add an interactable affordance state provider. Beautiful. Now with this affordance state provider, we can then add an audio affordance receiver. And as you can see, this has automatically added a new audio source, which is able to play an audio. Now for this audio source, let's remove the play on awake and we can set here the special blend to 3D as we want the audio playing on the interactable to be 3D. Now, again, for the min and max distance, what I like to do is set the max distance to 10 or even maybe to 5 to not have something too big. Beautiful. But now the important component is here down below, the audio affordance receiver. Now, as you can see, it needs a reference to the state provider. So let's drag it here over there. And it also needs the affordance theme datum. So basically what we've done is with this affordance state provider, we are able to add some visual or some audio when interacting with an object, like this little cube that we are able to grab. And with this affordance theme datum that we have not created yet, we will be able to say which audio we want to play. So let me show you. I'm going to right click in the project, go to create affordance theme and then to audio affordance theme. I'm going to rename it grab audio 
theme. And as you can see down below, we have a list of all of the interaction that we have when interacting with an object. Now, for example, in my case, I want to just play a little audio when we grab this cube. So what I'm going to do is simply drag the grab start under the state enter over there. Now we can go back to our audio affordance and drag the grab audio theme over there. And now everything is handled by doing so. Every time that we will grab this cube, a little audio will play. That's awesome. Now, the last thing that we want to do is simply here uh, set up the interactable source. So basically drag the cube XR grab interactable over there. But in my case, I will do it automatically and you will understand why in a minute. So to do so, I'm going to click on add component and add a noto find interactable uh, for dense. Now, this script will be really simple. We just need an awake function. And in the await, we want to get the component XR interactable affordance state provider and then do interactable source equals get component in parent of type XR base interactable. This way, we will be able to directly set the interactable on the affordance state providers. Now, we need two namespace, so let me just add them by simply using the light tips here. Now, as you can see, this has automatically added the two correct namespace. Now, we can save and go back to Unity. And if we wait for the script to compile, now, if I click on play, as you can see, by default, it automatically adds the interactable source in this on the void. affordance state According provider. That's awesome. And this means that now with the audio affordance, we can simply create a prefab out of this audio affordance and drag it under any grabbable object that we have and it will still play the audio. So that's an awesome way of basically populate your whole game with just one game object that is responsible to trigger the audio. Now, in this case, for the cube, these cubes are prefab. So if we go to override and click on apply all, it will apply this audio affordance change on all of the prefab, as you can see. Now, if we have a look at all of the little cube, they all have here an audio affordance as a child, which means that we will be able to directly play an audio when grabbing one of these cubes. But for example, for this gun, it is not done yet. What we can do is simply drag the audio affordance under our audio. Oh, and it's not happy right now because we have created a prefab out of the cube. So let me simply duplicate the audio affordance, put it under here. Then we can rename this audio affordance to simply remove the one at the end and drag it finally here. So there you go. Now with this, we have successfully managed to create an audio affordance prefab that will be able to add any audio to any XR grab interactable. So for example, if we go not under one of the cube, but under the space way small, we can simply drag it now under it. And we can do so with the sci-fi pistol as well. Beautiful. We can do so also for the space ways breakable and drag the audio affordance right under it. And we can do also for all of the rock parts that are created when we break the big rock. Beautiful. Now, one last thing to do, and it's to click on play to see if we are able to hear some audio when interacting with these objects. Beautiful, guys. Now, as you can see, if I try to grab one of the cube, you should hear a little grab audio. And as you can see, this is awesome. It really adds a nice layer of polishing to our game. And this does work on the cube, but also on the other interactable as well. But if you recall, we have more audio that we can add to our game. We have the door open, the spaceship background, the spaceship engine, and the spaceship gun. Now, to add them to our scene, I'm not going to use a Nafordan system. I'm simply going to add an audio manager that you should have in your project by importing the start scene. So, if we right-click, create empty, call it audio manager, and add an audio manager script. Now, if we double-click on this script, as you can see, it is really simple. It contains some data to create a sound. And if you create a list of sound, it basically at the start of the game, adds an audio source based 
on the different data that you want for this particular audio clip. And then you can just simply play and stop the audio that you want. But the secret on this component is that it has an instance, which is a singleton, which means that you will be able to call this audio manager anywhere in your project, which is super handy to quickly add some audio anywhere that you want. So let's add some data for all of the sound that we have here. So if we click on play, we can, for example, for the door open, call it door and drag the door open in the audio clip. For the volume, we can set it to 1. For the pitch, we can set it to 1. We don't want the door to loop, and we don't want it to play on awake, but we want it to assign a certain audio source. So if we go to our door over there, we can click on Add Component and add an audio source. Now, for this audio source, I'm going to set this its special blend to 3D, which will create kind of a sense of position for this audio source. It will feel like the audio is coming to a particular place in our world and not just to our ears. So let's go back to the audio manager. And for the audio source, we can select here the door. Beautiful. Now let's click on the plus button. Do it now for the spaceship background. So we can rename it spaceship background. Now the spaceship background is like a background noise that I want to have in our scene, like a white noise to feel like the player is inside an immersive world. So we can set here the volume to something really small because we just we don't want it to be too uh, intrusive. We want it to be a loop because I want this background sound to loop and we want it to be play on awake. Now for the source, for the audio source, let's set it to none. And automatically, the audio manager, if you don't set any audio source, it will add one directly on this game object. Okay, so let's create another one. And this one will be for the engine. We can drag here the spaceship engine, set the volume to something like 0.3. We can set it to loop, but we don't want it to play on awake. And for the engine sound, we don't want it to have any audio source. So finally, the last one is not the engine, but it is the pistol. So the thing that we have over there, we can drag the spaceship gun right there, set the volume to something a bit higher, like 0.5. We want it to loop if the players press on the pistol button for a long, long time, but we don't want it to play on awake. And for the source, what I'm going to do is click on our sci-fi pistol, then add an audio source and simply set the spatial blend to 3D. Beautiful. There you go. Now we can simply drag the sci-fi pistol for the source. And just like this, all of the audio of our game are located inside the same place under the audio manager. The last thing we need to do is, of course, to be able to call these audio when we particularly interact with an object. So, for example, let's do this with the sci-fi pistol. If we go back to the Meteor Pistol script right there, we can simply call audio manager dot instance dot play and just call the pistol name, which is the name of the audio. When we stop shooting, we can do the same. So I'm going to copy this line of code, but instead of play, do stop. Beautiful. Now let's do the same when we open or close the door. So if we go back to our little button, then on the button push open door, we can simply call when we toggle door open audio manager dot instance dot play and call our door audio name. As you can see, it is very simple. And last but not least, we need to set up the engine noise when we activate here uh, the spaceship movement. And we can do so in the space outside here on the space outside controller. And we can simply in the update function, if the lever dot value is true. So if the lever is on, we can do audio manager dot instance dot play and gen beautiful and else we can simply do audio manager dot instance dot stop but there is a little issue with this setup right there is that if we keep the lever value on the audio manager will try to play the engine sound every frame of the game as this is located inside the update but we of course want this to happen only once when we start activating or then we stop activating. And so to do so, I'm going to simply add a private bool called was on and simply set this was on to be 
the lever dot value at the end. And we can simply make sure that if the lever dot value is not equals to was on, this means that we will have a change of lever value and that we can simply stop or play the audio. And there you go. Now with this, everything should work. We have successfully managed to create an audio manager that is set up for all of the audio of our game and to link all of these audio with the interaction of our game. One thing is missing and it's of course to click on play to find out if everything works. And there you go, guys. As you can see, you can now hear the background audio that is looping and it's feeling just more and more immersive. You can, of course, grab some object and you will hear a little audio. And as you can see, the audio works as well for the door. It feels just so nice. And of course, the sound still works as well for the engine. And there you go guys, adding sound to a VR game is magic and it adds so much realism to all the interaction. Welcome to the last episode of the Let's Make a VR Game series. What a journey it has been and I hope that you enjoy following along. Now, in the last episode, we are going to do the final optimization to our game. I'm going to show you how to optimize the 3D model, the lighting, the project settings. And finally, we are going to build our game for desktop and Android to publish it on itch.io. Okay, guys, here you go. We are almost done with our game. The last step is to optimize this beautiful scene to make it work on any platform and make it run smoothly. Now, how can we know if our game is optimized? Well, there is ways. In the Unity editor, you have the profiler, which you can open by going here at tab profiler, and which will give you plenty information about the different usage of your CPU, of the rendering, of the memory, the audio, the physics, and so on. Now, this is one way to know if your game lags and is poorly optimized. The other way is to simply go in the game view here and click on the stats. As you can see, it did give you some information about the batches, the number of triangles seen by the players, but also about the frame per second. Now, this is of course working inside the Unity editor, but if you want to know if your game runs poorly when it's built, so outside of the Unity editor, you can do so by using this awesome performance head hub display tool, which is a tool made by Oculus, which will display the frame rate inside uh, the application. Now, more simply, you can also create a little script that will compute the frame per second of your game and display it in front of your camera. And for this, I recommend this awesome tutorial made by Fist Full of Shrink about how to add frame per second in your game. Okay, so this is the first step. Now to analyze the performance of your game. Now we won't go too much into details about this because what I really want to show you in these tutorials is the little tips and tricks that you can use to make your VR game run smoothly, but keep the same visual aesthetic. And so for this, I present to you the optimization checklist. Now, as you can see, the first two steps of the optimization checklist are the 3D model optimization and the complexity optimization. Now, these are just names that I made up here on the spot. But anyway, the first thing that you want to make sure when building a VR game is to make sure that the 3D model that you use are well optimized. This means that they have not a lot of triangles, that in most cases, they share the same material. So this will mean here that the number of material that you use in your project is as small as possible. And finally, that the shaders that are used are also optimized. Now, if we have a look at our project, as you can see, all of the 3D models that we've used here are really simple. And if we have a look at the material, they all share the same material, which is this base color one. And by default, we are using here the universal render pipeline lit. We could kind of optimize it a bit better by going to universal render pipeline and say the simple lit. But anyway, I will just leave it like this for now. But with this, you can see that our little VR game has already the first point completed. As first, the 3D models are pretty simple. They shared for most of the 3D models the same material. And finally, 
that the shadow that is used is not that complicated. So let's just go here and we can simply cross the first one. Okay, for the second one, the complexity optimization. Of course, the 3D model in your games are important, but the different interaction that you use are also. For example, is the physics optimized? Now, in the case of this VR game, we are using a minimalistic physics setup. We can grab object, we can move around, and that's it. So we are not using a lot of physical joint, for example, which make this physics VR game not too complicated. Of course, you can kind of design your VR game in a way to not use too many physical components. Or you can also go to Edit, Project Settings, and here on Physics, if you remember, there are some settings that you can use to kind of increase or decrease the physical computation of your game. Now, in our case, I think I will just leave it like this as the physics is not the bottleneck for this application as we are not using a lot of it. Now, regarding physics, another thing that you, we can talk is that you should not use mesh collider. You should keep uh, using box and capsule and sphere collider. And another thing is that if you are using a rigid body, so for example, here on this gun, you should set the collision detection to discrete. Okay, so that's the first step about the complexity optimization. We can cross here our physics optimization as it is already handled in the game. And now for the next one, the script optimization. Well, by default, we don't have a lot of computation that we've done inside the little script because most of the interaction of our game are also pretty simple. Now, this is a choice, of course, by design, but if you are making lots of computation within your VR game, I don't know what it can be. Maybe you are processing a lot of data on the back end or anything, but in the case of this VR game, we are not doing any of this. So let me just skip this. Now for the visual effect optimization, this is mostly are the particle systems in our game optimized? Are they not too many? Are the post-processing effect optimized? Are they not too many? And in the case of this VR game, if you remember, we can go to our post-processing volume and the only two post-processing that we've added are here the bloom and the color curve here. So nothing fancy. Okay, so we can cross here this last one and we can go to the next step to static optimization. And that's something that is not handled already by our VR game. So why is it important to know if an object is static or not in our game? First, it is because a common technique to optimize a scene is to use what's called a static batching. So basically, all the objects that are not moving, if they share a same material, will be batched together and sent to the GPU to be drawn on the screen. And secondly, having static objects can also improve the lighting settings. And that's something that we will talk about later on. Now, anyway, as you remember, we had this static environment game object, which was the parent of all of our environments. Now, I think then we've done a lot of improvement in our game and our hierarchy is not that well organized. So if we go, for example, under here or interactable, you can see that there are some static objects that are under interactable, like the trash, the space vacuum, the vortex, the energy analyzer and the ladder. So we can select them all and drag them under the static environment. Now, the, all of them will not move in our game. So that's why I'm doing this. Now for the sci-fi pistol, we can drag it under the interactable. Same goes for the space waste interactable and for the teleport anchor and for the teleport area. Okay, here you go. Now this way, we have set up all of the interactable under our interactable and all of the static things in our game under here, the static environment. And with this, what we can do is go at the top of the static environment and select this static icon. We can set yes, change children. So this will make sure that all of the children of this game object will be marked as static as well. And now by doing this and telling Unity what is moving and what is not, he can better optimize our game by default. Now that's awesome. And now back to our checklist, we can cross this one and it send us to the lighting optimization. Now, if we have a look at our lighting right now, it is in real time which means that if I take one of the light and that I move it around, as you can see, the blue light is changing in real time, which is really good. You have here the shadow that is moving also in real time. But of course, you guessed it, this is computer heavy. 
Oh, and by the way, here I remarked that this lighting post is not marked as static because I have placed them under this lighting game object. So what we can do is simply select all of these light corner and set them to static as well. This way, this game object will be static as well with the others as they are not moving. Now, anyway, here are the steps to bake the lighting in our game and make it more optimized while keep the same visual aesthetic. The first step is what we've done previously, which is to say what is static and what is not. And the second step is to say if our light will be real time or baked. For this, let's go to Windows, Rendering, Light Explorer, and here we can have a look at all of the light in our game. Now, as you can see, here are all the blue lights. So all we can select them with the caps key. And as you can see, they are all in real time. Now, in my case, I want them all to be baked. There you go. But now, because these are baked light, we can set their shadow to soft shadows. Now that they will be baked, we don't care if they have a shadow or not, because the shadow that they make will be baked. So they will not be uh, computed at every frame of the game, which is why we can do this now. Anyway, now we have three more light. We have a directional light, we have a point line and another point line. So three point line that are real time right now. And this is where basically you can say what you want to be baked or not. For example, if you don't want any real time shadow to be computed, you can select them all and set the mode to be baked. But in my case, I still want some real-time computation to occur. So I think what I'm going to do is set the directional line to be mixed. Now, mixed means that the light will be big, but it will still light non-static objects. Now, after setting the directional line to mixed, let's go to our next one, which is this point light, which is located in the spaceship control room. Now, on this one, I don't want it to be mixed, so I'm going to set it to bake. And finally, the last one is this one in the start zone on the spaceship. And I'm simply going to set it from real time to mixed. And there you go. This way, we will have just two light that will compute every frame of the game. But of course, if you want your VR game to be more optimized, you can set all of the light to baked. But in my case, I think it will be enough considering the complexity of my scene to leave two lights unbaked. Now, anyway, the light setup is done. We can close these windows. And now we can add two things. We can add a reflection probe. And if I go to right click, light, then reflection probe. Now the goal of a reflection probe is to do a bit the same like the lighting, which is big, the complexity of our scene somewhere, but to do so with the reflection. So after creating a reflection probe, we can place it in a certain zone and we can change here its box size to make it fit more or less the size of, of our game. So in my case, I'm going to add two reflection probe, one over there, and then duplicate this reflection probe to add a second one on the control room. And there we go. Now, as you can see, I have two reflection probe in my scene, which will be able to bake the reflection of our game. But that's not it. Now, remember that all of these blue light now are baked, which means that if the player approach is hand towards the blue light, well, the end will keep their initial color and not take the blue tint from this light. But there is a technique to actually fix this little issue and it's to use a light probe. So if we right click, go to light and then go to light probe group, we can place it over there. There you go. Now, as you can see, a light probe group is basically some point here. And this point will bake the lighting surrounding them and apply it to the non-baked object around the scene. So this light probe group will be the solution for our little issue. And what we can do is simply place it somewhere in our scene like this, and then click on edit light probe group. Now what we can do is here, select them all like this, and we can move one or multiple light probe. And if we press on control D, as you can see, we can start putting them everywhere in our world. Now, of course, the more light probe you make, the more details on the big lighting will be able to apply on the non-big lighting. 
Now, before starting this tutorial, I've already uh, done it and save it as a prefab here. So I can simply now drag it in our scene and there it is. Now I can simply remove the other light probe group. And there you go. Now, as you can see, I have the light probe set for all of the environments. And with this, all of the steps to bake the lighting are completed. Now, remember that we set some object to static. We set the light to baked. We added some reflection probe to bake the reflection and we added the light probe to be able to have some non-baked object be lit by the baked one. So the final step is of course to do the baking itself. And to do so, we need to go to Windows, Rendering, Lighting and this should open here the lighting settings. So here we have no lighting setting assets. So let's click on new. Beautiful. For the line mapper, I'm going to set it to GPU. Now I'm going to keep the light map resolution to 40, but if the computation takes too long, you can reduce this value. Then I'm going to check here the ambient occlusion, which will add a nice ambient occlusion effect in our scene, which are some added shadows when two mesh collides. And finally, I'm going to set the max light map size to 2048. And there you go, now everything is ready. Let's click on generate lighting to generate and bake the lighting of our scene into a light map. And there you go, believe it or not, but the baking is finished. Now, as you can see, it looks a little bit nicer than before, <laughs> but actually this is way more optimized. Now, for example, if I take this light right there and then I try to move it, as you can see, the lighting doesn't change on this post. And so, as you can see, everything is now baked. Now, little tips for you watching this video. You can also have a look at this light map by going to here, shading mode, and click on big light map. And here you can have a look at how the light map is directly applying to our scene. And as you can see, everything looks great, which means that we successfully managed to bake the light map for our game. Okay, let's go back to shading mode, shade it. There you go. I'm in love with the look that we've made on our game. It really looks great. And this means that we can now go back to our optimization checklist and then check here the lighting optimization as we've done everything on it. And now the next thing is the project setting optimization. Okay, so for now, if we go to edit, project settings, and then on quality, as you can see, we have three levels of quality for our game. We have height fidelity, which is selected right now, balance and performance. Now I'm going to just remove performance. There you go. And check the high fidelity only when we are on desktop and the performance only when we are on Android. Now, basically nothing has changed, but this means that when we build the game for desktop, we will have this level of fidelity. And when we build for Android, we will have performance. But if we build right now, this is not the look that we will have for Android. No, because if we select performance, now this is the look that you will see. And as you can see, everything is flat and I will show you why. So basically at this point, this means that we have now two settings, one settings for the high fidelity that will be used for desktop and another one that will be used for building on Android. So on the MetaQuest. In my case, I'm not going to modify the setting of the height fidelity, which I think are, are fine by default, but I think that we can slightly improve the performance settings that will be used when we build on Android. So let me show you how. First thing is to go here on texture streaming and to enable it. We go below, we have a bunch of other settings that are just fine like this. But if we click on the render pipeline asset, as you can see, this will highlight a certain setting in the project files that we can click on. And if we go to inspector, there it is. Now, this is an important page here because these are all the settings that are used to render on our game. By default, the URP performance, as the name suggests, is very performant. But in the case of this VR game, we can slightly improve it a little bit better. For example, the HDR that is used by the Bloom, we can enable it. And as you can see, we can now see the bloom again on off, on off. <laughs> now for the anti-aliasing, this is a setting for me, which is very important because the anti-aliasing can kind of remove the pixelization effect that we don't want on low end device. 
So in my case, I will set it to four, but if it's too much, you can of course set it to two. Then for the main light, in my case, I want to cast some shadow. We can then go to additional light. And now if you remember, if we go to edit, rendering, light explorer, we add two mixed light. We add the mixed directional light and the mixed point light. So this means that if we go to our settings, we need also to enable this two light over there. Now, in the case that you only have one light, you can simply set the additional light to disable. But in the case as I am right now with two light, I'm going to set it to per pixel and set the per object limit to one. There you go. Now, this additional light can cast some shadows. And as you can see with this, we are now able to see a little shadows of the end that are casted by this light over there. But this shadow is a bit blur right now. But we can improve the shadow at last resolution with setting it from 512 to 1024. Or you can even go higher and set it to 2048 and do the same for the main shadow resolution. Now, this will depend really if your game can manage it. In my case, I still think that 1024 will be enough. So I will just leave it like this. Anyway, now if we go below, we can see the shadow max distance. Now, this is a very important setting because we, of course, don't want shadows to be displayed after a certain distance. And there you go. Now, as you can see, if we decrease this value, it kind of hides all of the shadow that are casted by the real-time object that are not baked. Now, what I like to do is go to the maximum distance here on the scene windows, have a look at the object that I want to study their shadow and see how I can increase these settings to keep the shadow seen by the players. And as you can see, if I go to a value of eight, I can still see the shadows. And this feels like it is the minimal value for this. And of course, you want to set this max distance as low as possible. So eight feels like a good amount. Now let's go down below. You can here increase the cascade count, which will allow you to kind of blend between two resolution of shadow. And finally, you have here the soft shadow that you can enable. And basically, that's it with the settings of our project. With this, we have created kind of an optimized settings for our game. Of course, feel free to tweak it yourself and to play around the result. But now I think that the result is great. We can now go to our optimization checklist and just cross here the project setting optimization. And the last thing missing is the cooling. So this main camera by default will only render what's inside here, this view frustrum. So inside the field of view of the camera. But you can also create a maximum distance. And here, this is by the far plane. So maybe we can reduce this far plane to something a bit less. There you go. Or maybe 200 seems good enough. Now, my goal, of course, is to still be able to see the little asteroid here. So 200 feels really great. And this is basically a technique that you can kind of use to make sure that the objects that are not too far away can still be seen by the camera. But that's not it, because you have the first room cooling, which is the technique that only render what's inside the field of view of the player. But you have also the occlusion cooling within the Unity. So the occlusion cooling will mean that if you are looking in this direction, for example, so in the direction of the door, you will not render the objects that are hidden by the door, which, for example, is this ladder. So for this, it's very simple. We simply need to go to Windows, Rendering, Occlusion Cooling. And here we can simply click on bake. And now if we wait a little bit, as you can see, it is already working. Now, if we take the XR origin and that we rotate it around, here is what's happening. Now, as you can see, this is making sure to always display the only thing that the player is seeing in front of him. So that's another great optimization technique that is really easy to do. Okay, and just before finishing here this optimization part, something that I completely forgot is that if we take a look at this door, this door is set to static. But it is not static because this door, of course, needs to open. So here, make sure to uncheck these parameters to make sure that when the player press on the button over there, it can still open. Now for this, I'm going to go in under the static environment. 
and drag the door not under the static, but under the interactable over there. Beautiful. And there you go. Now you know what that means. We can go back to our optimization checklist and remove the last one, which means that we have successfully managed to optimize our VR game. So congratulations. Now it is time to build a game to test if what we made is well optimized. Okay, and to do so, let's go to File, Build Settings. Now remember, this is where we can build our VR game. But just before clicking on the Build and Run, let's go to Player Settings. And here on the company name, I'm going to simply write Velum. Then on the product name, Space Scrapper is fine. Now for the default icon, uh, before recording this video, I made a very cool icon over there that we can simply drag here. Beautiful. Now let's close. And finally, let's click on build and run to build our game. And there you go. After a little bit more than 10 minutes, the game is now built and we can see it over there with the beautiful icon that we've created. Now, as you can see, the game still works beautifully outside of Unity. <laughs> okay, so now that we build the game for desktop, I'm going to simply right click and zip the file so that we will be able to share it more easily. Now it is time to build it not for Windows, but for Android. So let's select Android over there and click on Switch Platform. And now get ready to wait a little bit longer. Okay, and here you go. Now everything is working well. And we have currently managed to switch platform to Android. And as you can see, the scene is still looking great. But now, of course, now that we have switched the platform, we can build to Android to directly output this game to the Oculus Quest. So I'm simply going to click on Build and Run and go to Builds, then create a new folder called Android Build. And now let's just hope that everything will work. And there you go, guys. Now I'm inside my Quest, so no more external computer involved. Purely the Oculus Quest handling all of the job here. And for now, everything seems to work. I can still see the beautiful menu. And let's start and go inside the spaceship. And there you go, guys. As you can see, everything runs smoothly. And the VR game is now completed. We have successfully managed to create a build for desktop, but also for Android. And everything runs smoothly. Now, congratulations if you managed to get to this part. And for my final trick, the thing that I want to show you is that now that we have a build that is working for Android and for desktop, what we can do is actually publish it on a web store that will be able to store our VR game. Now, in my case, I will simply post the space creeper here on itch.io. Now, it is very simple. You simply need to create a developer account. And then if you go at the top and select upload new project, you should be able to see this and where you can fill all of the details of your game, like the title, the short description, and so on. I've also added some screenshot and some GIF about it with an icon over there. And here we can upload the file. So let's click on upload. Now we can select our desktop build and click on open. We can click again on upload file, but this time select the APK. And there you go now that the two builds are uploaded. We can simply go below, set the visibility to public and click on save. And now if we click on the view page, as you can see, I've already done a little bit of beautiful work here to showcase the game in its best shape. And now, as you can see, you can send this link to all of your friends and they will be able to download your game from this page. This is awesome. And there you go, guys. Well, all good things come to an end. And while well, this is not the last tutorial that you will see on this channel, this is the last episode of this series. I want to particularly thank you all for following along and to all the awesome Patreon who are the ones making it possible for me to do this. Of course, you can join them to get access to the complete final Unity project. And if you just want to try the game, I will leave in the description the link for the itch.io page. Now that this series is over, I want to hear what you think about it and what I should cover in the next video. Thank you for watching and see you very soon. Bye bye.